the Committee for Youth Services Fiscal Year 2020 Preliminary Budget has now been called to order. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Fiscal 2020 Preliminary Budget Oversight Hearing for the Department of Youth and Community Development. I am, I am Council Member Debbie Rose. I'm the Chair of the Committee on Youth Services. And I am proud and pleased to be joined by my fellow council members, council member Eugene and council member Chin. And we will hear today from the DYCD commissioner, Bill Chong, associate commissioner, Jandine Fanor, along with the agency's team of program specific deputies and associate commissioners. Thank you all for joining us. Um, the well-being of New York City's youth and the efficiency of the delivery of services has always been my primary concern as um, I've devoted most of my career to youth services. And so first and foremost, we are here to discuss DYCD's $755 million budget for fiscal year 2020. The preliminary budget includes only one new need for DYCD supporting programming for the Summer Youth Employment Program, or SYEP. A change reflected from the new RFP issued in November 2018. What is just as thought provoking as recurrently is the case for DYCD is that the preliminary budget does not include. Namely, as the new chair for this committee, I am concerned about the administration's decision to discontinue support for middle school summer programming under Schools Out NYC, or SONIC, leaving 22,800 children without services this summer. When this administration began its first term, we heard about the importance of protecting 12-year-olds to 14-year-olds from negative influences outside of their homes and schools. It seems disingenuous to us as a city to continue to suggest that this is a non-essential program. As a legislative body representing 8.5 million of our fellow New Yorkers, it is our responsibility as a council to ensure that the city's budget is as fair, transparent, and accountable as it can possibly be. That is why this year, beyond simply discussing funding levels, the council is also taking a deep look into the structure of each agency's budget. For DYCD, this means continuing the conversation about the limited number of units of appropriation used to organize funding for 10 different program areas. This committee will also review DYCD's performance so far this year. As reported in the fiscal 2019 preliminary mayor's management report, here, too, I believe we will have just as interesting a conversation about what is not included in the PMMR, Mayor's Preliminary uh, Report, is as about what is. The uh, Preliminary Mayor's Management Report does a poor job of contextualizing the data it provides. When we look at programming and services for some, new, some of New York's youth, like DYCD's Cornerstone and Beacon Program recipients, we wanna have the clearest sense possible of why city services are seeing reductions in these two programs. Are these reductions the result from transitioning into the new passport system or are programmatic issues at play? DYCD has been tasked with managing the preparation of this city's next generation of leaders to fulfill their potential. Programs like the Comprehensive After School System, COMPASS, and the Summer Youth Employment Program, SYEP, are intended to help young New Yorkers rise to the next level. I am myself a product of SYEP, and my experiences from that first job really helped to mold me um, and prepare me for the world of work. The committee wants to ensure that these programs are serving as many young people as possible. I look forward to a productive conversation. And before we begin, I would like to thank Christine Johnson, my chief of staff, Esma Elam Rusi, and Christian Ravello, my legislative aide, 
Michelle Peregrin, my financial analyst to this committee, Isha Wright, who is the unit head of the finance division, Paul Senegal, counsel to committee, Kevin Katowski, policy analyst to the committee, and Elizabeth Arts, our community engagement liaison, Commissioner Chong and Associate Commissioner Fanor, our council will now swear you in. And thank you for being here. Please raise your right hands. And actually all of you who are testifying. <laughs> Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony and to respond honestly to council member questions? Would you please state your names for the record? Uh, I'm Bill Chong, Commissioner of DYCD. Susan Haskell, Deputy Commissioner. Andre White, Deputy Commissioner. Jadeen Fanor, Associate Commissioner. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Rose and members of the Committee on Youth Services. I'm Bill Chong, Commissioner of the Department of Youth and Community Development. I'm joined by Jadeen Fanor, DYCD's Chief Financial Officer, Susan Haskell, Deputy Commissioner for Youth Services, and Andre White, Deputy Commissioner for Youth Workforce Development. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today on DYCD's fiscal year 2020 preliminary budget. Since coming into office, Mayor de Blasio has demonstrated an unwavering commitment to youth, families, and communities. Through his efforts and the support of the City Council, DYCD's budget has more than doubled from 408.6 million to 902.9 million. DYC's fiscal 2020 preliminary budget stands at 755.2 mil, 755 million. This budget continues to build on our progress serving young people and families while being fiscally responsible and cautious during these times of financial uncertainty. Despite these challenges, the past year has been one of remarkable growth for DYCD. In 2018, with the strong support of the Council, the Summer Youth Employment Program set another record serving nearly 75,000 young people at 13,701 work sites. Working together last summer, the mayor and the council increased funding and, and the budget grew by 18% to a new high of 150 million. We've achieved a 14% increase in work site development, uh, exposing participants to a wider variety of opportunities. 44% of the work sites were in the private sector, uh, 41 percent in the nonprofit organizations and 15 percent in government agencies. SYE participants worked in financial, cultural, media, entertainment, and healthcare institutions. Examples of such placements include the Bank of America, A&E Networks, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and Maimonides Hospital. Building on these efforts, after years of thoughtful planning, two weeks ago, we released awards under the new request for proposal. The program design builds on recommendations from the Youth Employment Task Force commissioned in June 2016 by Mayor de Blasio and the Council. That task force focused on how to bring relevant, innovative workforce experiences to youth through SYP. The recommendations that were incorporated into the request for proposal include strengthening connections between SYP providers and public high schools to improve in-school career development for young people serving younger youth through career exploration and project-based learning experiences, and enhancing support services, including pre-program orientation and counseling to help meet the unique needs of vulnerable uh, young people. While we're still working with providers on their final awards, we are pleased that we announced 195 awards to 67 providers, including 23 new providers. This represents double the awards from the last RFP. In the most significant transformation in the program's 56-year history, we are meeting the next generation of, of talent where they are by revolutionizing the way young people experience and connect to, to their interests and career options. By providing structured project and work-based opportunities, New York City's youth are better prepared for the careers of the future. SYP enhancements include new school-based opportunities and outreach to young people who are homeless, in foster care, juvenile justice involved, or living in select NYCHA developments. Employers can tap into the expanding pipeline of talent and hire job-ready summer employees to increase workforce diversity and fill critical uh, gaps in their organizations. With a budget of $150 million, we estimate being able to serve 
70,000 young people this summer. While serving some of the city's most vulnerable youth, the administration has made extraordinary investments of $30 million in services for runaway and homeless youth, for a total of $43 million. Funding supports more beds in new residential programs, drop-in centers, LGBTQ services, and increased mental health resources. We now fund eight drop-in centers, including one in each borough that is open 24-7, and a new program in Far Rockaways. The administration has funded 500 new beds for runaway and homeless youth ages 16 to 20, essentially tripling the resources for youth. In total, 23 new sites have been opened during this administration. Since I last testified in May, five new sites have opened, including one last week created, operated by Edwin Gould, Gould Services for Children and Families. They are, they are located in Brooklyn, Bronx, and Queens, adding 68 beds for a total of 625. There are seven contracted sites pending for a total of uh, uh, 128 beds remaining to be opened by June 30th. We, are, we would also like to report on our progress towards the goal of serving homeless youth uh, ages 21 to 24 and new runaway and homeless youth residential programs. With the support of the City Council, $3 million in the FY19, 2019 adopted budget was allocated for residential beds. DY, issue, uh, DY City issued a request for a proposal in August 2018 and awarded contracts in late October to uh, four experienced RHY providers in four boroughs. Providers have identified uh, suitable residential sites and they are in the review process by the New York uh, State Office of Children and Family Services. It's our goal to open 60 new beds for runaway and homeless youth by the end of fiscal 2019 or as soon as state certification is issued. DYC is working closely with the provider and New York State to expedite the rigorous process. We are pleased that our 91 Beacon community centers will be funded at 67.2 million. Each Beacon budget grew to more than 600,000, an increase of almost 250,000 in the last three years. Based on youth programs and designed to help education, uh, help uh, participants acquire the skills and um, attitudes that, that are needed to succeed in their chosen career, and get back to the community, and Beacon adult programs are designed to enhance skills and promote social instruction, community engagement, and physical activities. Together, these sites serve over 109,000 young people and families annually. Cornerstone community centers provide youth with a safe place to grow with engaging activities, including recreation, STEM, academic achievement, project-based learning, and social emotional support. They engage over 18,000 young people and adults annually at 94 NYCHA developments across the city and are budgeted at 46.8 million next year. For the third year in a row, Cornerstones and Beacon uh, programs will be sponsoring Spring into Health, Fair, health Fairs to offer wellness activities and information and promote healthcare access. We expect there to be a total of 70 health cares in five boroughs during the week of May 13th to May 19th. We invite you to join us at our program in your neighborhood. DYCD's Compass and After School programs, including Sonic Middle School programs, have served more than 115,000 young people this year in more than 920 program sites. These programs are budgeted to receive $334 million. Compass programs offer comprehensive programming five days a week, including recreation, enrichment, and cultural activities to support and strengthen the overall development of young people. In fiscal 19, thanks to the collaboration of the mayor and the council, the city invested an additional 12 million to increase adult literacy services. Approximately 8 million have been spent, uh, have been spent to expand existing contracts and support new programs, serving 8,356 more individuals. We continue to offer teacher training courses, professional development in instructional technology and curriculum development as part of our efforts to pr provide sustained quality instructional services. As you have heard in my testimony today, despite budget uncertainties, the FY 2020 uh, preliminary budget continues to place DYC in a very strong position to fund quality programs that improve the lives and, up, uh, and create opportunities to enhance uh, advanced social e economic, to advance uh, social economically. We look forward to uh, continuing the work with the City Council to support New York City's youth, families, and, commu and communities. Thank you again for the chance to testify today. We are ready to answer any questions.
Thank you. Thank you so much, Commissioner. Um, I just want to say, if anybody wants to testify, please make sure you fill out a slip so that we can um, include you. Um, so, our expense budget um, in D DYCD has a total proposed budget of $755 million for fiscal year 2020. The fiscal 2020 financial plan includes one new need for DYCD and the Summer Youth Employment Program. The fiscal 2020 preliminary plan adds 32.7 million in fiscal 2020, um, and it's going to grow to 36.7 million in fiscal year 2023, the out years. To support the new SYAP programs awarded through the recent request for a proposal. So, um, within the fiscal 2020 preliminary budget for DYCD. Um, we see very little change from the previous years. So how does DYCD prioritize its request for new or increased funding? So I think the difference between the adopted last year and the preliminary this year is the, uh, what's added on in the negotiation process with the administration. So for us, uh, my priority has always been to provide stable funding for core programs. So. For example, I've, I asked this year, as I've done in previous years, to baseline the funding for the Sonic Summer component, because I think a core program needs to have stable funding. Unfortunately, I wasn't successful. I will continue to advocate for any program that relies on one year, any core program that relies on one year funding, we want to ensure stability. Uh, we'll continue to advocate for that, as well as for literacy, because I think that's a core program of DYCD and it shouldn't have to rely on money that's added in the adopted budget. The rest, um, um, Jadine can give you the difference in, between the adopted last year and the preliminary this year. So the majority of the funding that falls off, because in 19 we have almost $900 million, is um, council funding. We get a, a large amount in youth and we get a large amount in, um, in the community development areas as well. Um, and like the commissioner alluded to, we lose one-time funding. Um, and again, I will um, mirror what the commissioner said. We um, put in a lot, um, a, a major amount of the core programs that we want. We ask for them, we advocate for them, and we were unsuccessful. Um, I would just like to add, you will, con you will continue to advocate for them, Most yes? Most definitely. Okay. Um, and so, were there any other new needs that DYCD proposed that have not been included in the fiscal 2019 preliminary budget? I mean, we were very aware, as I'm sure you're aware, that we're he heading into a sort of a new economic reality of uh, uncertainty with the city's budget. So, overall, I don't, if you saw in the preliminary budget, there were very few new needs uh, across the board. So, my focus was stability in core programs because um, it wasn't that long ago, um, and many of you were probably on the council, when half our budget uh, relied on one-year restorations by the city council. Fortunately, we're not in that situation where our, most of our core programs have stable funding for multiple years, with one exception being Sonic Summer and the additional support we get for literacy programs. You know, I would like to have those programs baseline uh, in this difficult time. It's money that's spent anyway, so I, I advocated in the preliminary budget, I will continue to advocate in the executive budget, and, and we welcome the support the council has for those two programs, because we, we think those are core programs that should have stable funding. Um, in the mayor's briefing, the administration called for programs to eliminate the gap, or a PEG, of 750 million to be reflected in the executive budget. DYCD has been called to fill this gap by 11.5 million. Where does the department anticipate these funds coming from? And will DYCD's gap impact programmatic services? So we don't have a proposal yet that I can share. Uh, we're still um, working through different options. But let me make this uh, clear for me. Um, it's very personal, the pegs has more so per perhaps than any other commissioner because I served as a deputy commissioner at DYCD in the Bloomberg administration for six and a half years. 
So I personally presided over 10 pegs. Uh, and so I, it was, it's very painful. So I will do everything within my power to make sure it doesn't impact the mission, our agency, and that we minimize impact on current programs. Um, the proposal has not been submitted. I actually haven't reviewed options yet, so I don't want to go into any hypothetical things. But once we have a final proposal submitted to OMB and it's approved, I'd be happy to go into details in the executive budget process. Um, I, I appreciate that, you know, you also um, feel that, you know, the pig might impact um, programs, um, but you haven't looked at any, any of, of uh, your budget to, you have no idea where the pig where the cuts might come? Hi. Um, you know, we received our peg in the midst of preparing for the budget hearings. Um, as the commissioner said, we will definitely get you guys details as we share some um, ideas with the commissioner and we, um, you know, finalize what we what kind of options we have. Again, we are committed to our youth, our adults, our core programs, and we're going to do whatever or try to put up things that are minimal to programming as much as we can. I mean, we're always committed to reducing our non-program expenses. Um, I mean, in the uh, committee report, you know, it's pointed out, it's something that I've said repeatedly, 94% of our budget uh, goes out the door. So while we're not a direct service agency, 94% of our budget does go out the door. So we've always looked for ways to reduce our non-program expenses. So. In December of 2014, without much, much fanfare, we moved 60% of our agency to rent-free space. So, we, we, so we're always looking to be creative in how we become more lean and mean. I mean, we're not a big agency. We're 520 people, but I think we have a huge impact on the communities because we work with our nonprofit partners to make sure they get the resources to deliver an array of services. So. Um, in the executive budget, I'm sure this will be discussed, um, and I'll be happy to go into specifics. When I have specifics, I can share. In the past, have you sort of looked at taking it from uh, PS or OTPS or? Um, yes, but it's only 6% of our budget. Mm -hmm. So uh, that kind of limits the field. And then um, when you talk about PS, you're talking about people. So uh, the, the administration is not doing any layoffs. Mm -hmm. So we're limited to like, vacancies, and there are only so many vacancies at any given time. So again, it's a tough uh, process. Uh, we hope to try to minimize impact on current services. And once we have a plan that's approved by OMB, uh, I will be glad to discuss them with you. OK, so traditionally, you usually look at taking it from? Non-program areas, no. if possible. Okay. Okay. But you know, and, and again, I, I, 6 percent of our budget is non-program. Okay. And I, and I want to thank you, you know, I want to appreciate your, your advocacy, even though the mayor, you know, um, has repeatedly stated that he doesn't um, sort of uh, see the value in Summer Sonic. So I appreciate that. Um, and I, I hope you continue to advocate fiercely as we are. Um, this past November, long after long negotiations with the council, DYCD released the new RFP for SYEP. We have also just received a number of details since the contract has uh, been issued, ju has just been issued. Um, and we thank you, but we're having some difficulty getting the information um, when we request it. So I I'm sure you'll, you'll work with us to Right. So I mean, expedite the responses to our requests. Right, Andre. Well. Okay. It, I'm talking about in other program areas also. Go ahead, Andre. Oh. Right. So you can I see. see Michelle and I see Isha. Um, we have definitely um, prepared and we're in the process of working on getting the details. I think um, last week. Friday, if I'm not mistaken, or Thursday, we shared some information um, on SYEP. 
Um, but if there's anything outstanding, we're more than willing to continue working with you guys and getting you the information you need. And I apologize if you haven't received it yet. Thank you. Um, we were trying to prepare our statement too, and we were um, experiencing some delay in response. But um, would you like to uh, address the, um, the, the question is, does DYCD still anticipate rolling out WLG or Work, Learn, Grow in fiscal year 2020? So uh, Work, Learn, and Grow, as you know, has been a council-funded initiative for the last, I believe, four years. So um, if the council is able to, in the negotiations to the adopted budget, able to add that money, uh, we'd be glad to implement it. We just didn't have the funding to do the expanded SYP model with the additional cost that model uh, incurred, as well as Work, Learn, and Grow. But if, if the money is identified, we'd be happy to do the program again. So um, you're uh, looking for the council to provide the funding for Work, Learn, Grow? It's been a council-led initiative for the last four years. So we had to make a choice between making sure that there was enough funding for the SYP program with all the different new models that came out of the work group with the council. So we had to, again, focus on the core program, which is the summer youth employment program. Work, Learn, and Grow is a supplement to SYP, which we greatly appreciate, and you know, if in the course of the uh, discussions for the adopted budget, if the funding becomes available, we will work with our providers to make sure it happens. Does DYCD believe that the next RFP um, to be issued in the fall will capture uh, the new providers as the transition of the program services continue to change? You're talking about the SYP RFP? I'm talking about um, Work, Learn, Grow. Oh, SYEP. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. SYEP. Well, so I'll have Andre go through the, the changes. The RFP was released last fall, mm -hmm. and so the awards have been attentively announced. Mm -hmm. So he can go through the highlights if you, if you want. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So as the commissioner mentioned, we awarded um, 195 awards to 67 unique providers. We're happy to report that 23 of those providers are new to the SYP portfolios. We're very excited to have them on board. Um, we're in the midst of negotiation, negotiating and talking to providers. Um, as we roll out the program for 2019, we have our, an orientation tomorrow where we're bringing all the new groups to DYCD to sort of run through all the requirements necessary to get the program up and running. So we're definitely moving full steam ahead. Will the slot allocation distribution continue to shift? And what would that shift look like? Absolutely. So um, as you know, as I mentioned before, we're still negotiating with providers. For example, this week alone, at, last week, I'm sorry, I had three calls with various executive directors from different programs as we're thinking through what is the best option for their agency. And that process is going to continue maybe for another week or two. So yes, the, the slot allocations will continue to shift until all decisions have been made final. Over the past five years in particular, the council has advocated for an expansion of SYEP to support 100,000 jobs so as to better meet the demand. Last year, DYCD received over 164,000 applications and made 122,000 offers and enrolled 74,354 participants. The record funded um, amount of slots or, you know, to date, has or will DYCD and the administration expand the baseline allotment of slots from 70,000 to 100,000? Because there clearly is a demand. At this point, there, there's no plans to expand the baseline funding, but if in the course of the conversations to an adopted budget, if additional money is added this year, I think we're uh, well positioned to take on many more additional jobs. Uh, one of the challenges over the years is that when we uh, procured the Summer Youth Employment Program in 2012, seven years ago, mm -hmm. the, the uh, 
the intention was to serve 30 to 33,000 young people, and so we awarded uh, uh, money for 101 programs. And that limited our, our ability to uh, absorb last-minute money. So, um, in fact, one year, I think it was 2015, we had 20,000 jobs added two weeks before the start of summer, and it puts a big strain on the infrastructure. One of the great things about this request for proposal is we've doubled, mm -hmm. almost doubled the number of programs. So if the council decides to add additional funding, whether it's 5,000, 10,000, whatever the number is, we're in a better position to absorb additional funding. Okay, so um, work, learn, grow. Uh, fiscal year 2019 represents the fourth year of the council's year-round youth employment in in initiative, Work, Learn, Grow. In the first year, the administration picked up the cost in a one-shot for $19 million. Could you please confirm how many enrolled participants are currently in Work, Learn, Grow? What does DYCD anticipate the total cost for fiscal 2019's program to be? by season's end on February, uh, I'm sorry, on April 15th. And then Thank I have a couple more questions. Sure. Um, for Work, Learn, and Grow, we receive over 13,000 applications. We were able to enroll 4,350 young people. Um, within the portfolio, we have 33 providers, um, and we have 40 programs. Um, as you know, Work, Learn, and Grow is geared towards older youth, young people ages 16 through 21, and they're engaged in work activities for an average of 10 hours a week. Um, and I'll hand it over to Jadeen to talk about the, the budget piece. So generally, we wait to find out what the allotment um, for work, learn, and grow is going to be. Um, the minimum wage began at 15 million. It should be in the same range. It depends on, um, you know, last time when the program started, we had older youth and younger youth, and we've transitioned just to the older youth. So um, it, it's, it's collaboration with the council and figuring out what exactly um, are the assumptions and the details that you guys want, and then we work up the figures. And so if it's 19 million, we're going to try to serve the same amount of youth given um, the funding that we receive. So it's predicated on funding. So um, what will it cost to continue supporting 5,000 participants um, at the same number of hours this year, next year? So again, it, so I work with the program folks and it depends on how many hours they want the older youth to work. It's not just a straight across. The same number of hours. The same number of hours, so it's the 19 million because we've already transitioned to the 15 um, um, minimum wage. So, you know, in the previous years, it was an incremental increase, but we've kind of flatlined, and so it would be the same thing. Same cost, same 19 million. But uh, you said the 19 million um, served uh, 4,000 youth, I thought. 4,500, it's yeah. around that yeah. rate, yeah. So, okay, so 5,000. I mean, if you, if you wanted a, a little bit more, than obviously, right. Mm -hmm. Okay, and how has the programming for Work, Learn, Grow changed uh, over the past year? So, so as Jadine mentioned, um, we, we moved towards serving older youth, young people ages 16 through through 21, and the idea there is to ensure that they're placed in work sites or job placements where they could develop the skills and competencies um, once they exit the program to prepare them not only for the future of work, but to help them determine the career path that they want to pursue. Um, the, the good thing about Work and Look Grow that providers um, tend to like is that they get an opportunity to work with the young people um, for a long period of time, and they're able to do a lot more deeper assessment around what their needs and interests are and develop whatever supports they might need throughout the, the, the six months, I'm sorry, the five months of work learning and grow. Um, I have one more question because I know my colleagues have, um, have questions and we've been joined by the majority leader. DYCD has an estimated release of the new, for the new advanced and EARN program for April 2019. What services will this program provide? 
This RFP was supposed to be issued in February and then March and now April. Why does this RFP keep being pushed back? So let me, uh, let me start. So uh, we're working in collaboration with the Office of uh, Economic, Opportun Economic Opportunity, Opportunity, which used to be Center for Economic Opportunity, to come up with a strategy that serves the, the, the wide range of young people who are disconnected. Because you have a broad range of young people, some who are, have a fourth grade reading level and some who have a high school degree, uh, diploma. And we wanted to have a much more streamlined strategy to working with this universe of young people because one size does not fit all. So the idea was to combine different programs like young adult internship program, which used to be called Intern and Earn, to do that. So to do this, because this is a significant change, uh, we worked with the nonprofit partners, Jobs First convened focus groups, which led to more ideas of how to design this program. So the reason I think there was a delay is that we wanted as much input from the nonprofits that would be running this program, so it, it made sense to them. So Andre, even sure, you yeah, want to say? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the commissioner is absolutely right. Um, we, a few months ago, we engaged a number of nonprofit partners and young people themselves, um, and we ran a program modeled by them to solicit their feedback. And what we learned is that there is a lot more rigorous programming that folks want to see for this population. Um, after we released a report for the, the stakeholder engagement, we then released a concept paper. Once we released the concept paper, we received quite, um, I want to say 11 pages of feedback from, from the provider community. And to the commissioner's point, that is important to us because we don't want to implement and roll out a program that our partners are not interested in or our program that our partners don't think is going to serve young people well. So keeping that in mind, we had to go back to the drawing board and tweak the model. And we are still in the process of talking to young people. We're still in the process of talking to our partners. We're bringing on TA providers and run these ideas by them to make sure that we're developing a model that young people could benefit from. A young Mod, um, a model that is also, when tested and evaluated, will show the impact that we want to see on the ground, and also a model that will be sustainable over time. So um, do you believe that you'll be ready for your projected date of April, or if not, when? Yes, I, my team and myself actually saw a first draft of the RFP, and we think by April, um, in the next few weeks, we'll share with the commissioner, and I think by April, we'll be able to release. Um, and how many youth will this program support? And yeah. what is the budget um, for this new RFP? So as you know, because the RFP is not public yet, unfortunately, I'm, I'm unable to share the budget um, or the number of young people that we'll be serving. What I can share is information from the concept paper, which is around serving up to anywhere from 600 to 800 young people across three different areas. So to the commissioner's point, um, we are creating a program for young people who are low literacy readers, right? Hoping that they will make some gains and then they could transition into what we're calling a pre-ACH, pre -ACH, pre-HSC track, which is attaining their, formerly known as the GED. Once they attain their GED, they could then transition into what we're calling advanced training, which is industrial, I'm sorry, yep, industrial credential trainings. So um, where you're looking at about roughly 600 to 800 students, and are you then looking at sort of the per, per uh, student rate? Of Absolutely. Like and so is that the higher rate at $800 per um, student? So, right? so the rate for advance and earn, again, we solicit feedback from the provider community. We look at current models across the country to see exactly what those price per participants are. We talk to young people to figure out the number of support services that they will need. Um, and we also take into consideration staffing plan. We take into consideration the internship component. We want to create a learning community for providers, which is a capacity building aspect of the program. Um, so taking all of those factors and elements into mind, um, we have come up with, we have landed on a PPP that I think providers um, would be okay with. <laughs> Will um, the uh, RFP mirror the concept paper? I'm sorry? Will the amount mirror the concept paper? Will the RFP 
mirror the amount in the concept paper? I think so, yes. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, I'm, I'm just wondering how DYCD can go forward with a new program under the Mayor's PEG program. How is the Mayor's PEG going to impact this new program going forward? This was funding set aside by the Office of um, Economic Opportunity. So it's actually, actually money not in our budget yet, but usually gets added in the executive budget. So it's not even in, uh, in the realm of consideration because it's, it sits somewhere else, the money. And it'll be exempt from the pig. Well, that's, we, we hope so. I mean, but that's for the Office of Economic Opportunity to decide since it's in their budget that gets transferred to us each year in the executive budget. And we're working uh, closely with them in redesigning this program. So I just want to make sure that, but if they decide it's a part of their peg, then we might It's not, not in my budget to peg, so I can't peg it. No, but you said from the economic. Right. Right. So I can't they. speak for them, but we've gotten no indication that to not do this program. In fact, we've worked very closely with them for over a year because they're very invested in doing this. They recognize that um, there's not, uh, there needs to be innovative programming for young people who are, you know, for, who, for, for those who start with the third or fourth grade reading level, how do we move the needle on the dial to get them to a high school uh, equivalency so they can so you're, enter the workforce. So, so I think there's a lot of interest. So you're for our most vulnerable, right? Yes, I mean, I think so there's a lot of interest in, in doing this program. So I would be surprised if the Office of, uh, the, Office of Economic Opportunity decided to peg it, given the amount of work that's been invested in this. Thank you. Um, I go back to the first two and get some Council Member Eugene. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you. I'm sorry? Thank you. Uh, Commissioner, thank you very much for your testimony and also to all your staff members. Thank you for what you have been doing for your, our young people in New York City, and you continue to do. And uh, you know that we in the City Council, we are very concerned. We are very concerned, you know, and uh, we work together and we work a lot to ensure that our young people can benefit from the good uh, services that are available through DYCD. Uh, uh, let me ask you, what was the budget of DYCD for the previous year, that means 2019? What was the budget of DYCD? It's, it's uh, 902.8 million. 900? And two, 902.9 million. And what will it be for 2020? 755.2 million. So that means there is a decrease, right? Right, and I expressed to Chair Rose that the majority of it is funding that um, you put in for Council Manic. Uh, uh, the largest majority is the Council funding that we that you add for discretionary programs. Oh, yeah, okay, now I got it now. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, and Chair Rose mentioned that we have been advocating uh, the City Council members, the advocate, the service providers, even the youth, uh, you know, and other to reach 100,000. Uh, 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 slot for summer jobs. And we all know the importance of summer jobs for our young people. The difference, the impact, the positive impact on, on the life of, of our young people. And we all, we were expecting, you know, to reach those 100,000 slot. But it seems that uh, we were able to reach 75,000 jobs. That was remarkable, that was historic, that was great. But it seems that we're going backward now. The expectation based on your uh, testimony is about 70,000 jobs, right? Well, let me say that, you know, since um, I was at DYCD uh, during the Bloomberg era, that uh, I don't think we would, we would have ever expected to be at 75,000 jobs. As I, mean, I said, that was his story. And I, and I want to thank up, you yeah. personally, because I know when you chaired the committee, you were one of the biggest advocates for increasing the summer youth employment program. And I know when at the end of the Bloomberg administration, it was about 33,000? Oh, 30,000. 30, 
you know, 30,000 jobs. So to go in the five years from 30,000 to 70,000 baseline and the 5,000 added last year is truly a miracle uh, that we appreciate the council's advocacy. And the, the biggest uh, uh, thing I always asked for and uh, my, my uh, wishes came true in 2016 was to get the funding baseline because you know, you can't redesign a program unless you know how much money you have. Uh, I said this to David Jones when he came to meet with me um, about the, the Community Services Society report on the Summer Youth Employment Program. He and I had, had many of the same ideas that, came, that also were reflected in the uh, council uh, work group. Uh, but I said to David, and you know, David may, may not know, he was ch uh, chair of the Youth, uh, youth Bureau in the Koch administration, which was the predecessor agency of DYCD. I said to David, can't we design a program unless I know how much money I have? And you can't run a program when more than half your budget doesn't come in until two weeks before the start of the uh, uh, program. So thank you again for advocating for the funding to get baseline. That has gotten us to this point, two and a half years of working and planning with the council, with the advocates, with you know stakeholders. We we, we like to call this SYP 3.0 because uh, for many years SYP didn't change. It came to DYCD in 2005. We made changes and so this is SYP 3.0. Um, we're always open to adding additional funding in the adopted budget. So, and now we're in a position now uh, to absorb more jobs because we have 195 programs that can be in a position to better absorb money that comes in two weeks before the start of the program. When we reach 75,000 slots or 75,000 jobs for the young people, the budget of New York City was less than what is projected to be in 2020. Now we have a lot of money. We have more money than before. So that means that uh, we, I personally believe that uh, the increase of the budget of New York City could benefit also the summer youth program, the young people. Because we also, always we say that the young people, they are the future of the city, the future of the nation, the future leaders. But I think that uh, it is our responsibility. We have to do everything possible to make sure that we have more funding or necessary funding to this great program and other to help more young people to benefit from that. Because we all know that, that, know that not only the young people benefit from that, but from this great program, but their parents also, because they come from family, very humble families, families uh, that are facing financial difficulties. So my question is, we were able to reach that historic number because we were working together, as you know, uh, advocates, youth pro providers, community-based organizations, city council members, but now we have, we have more money in the budget of the city council. I believe if we duplicate, or if we continue to work together and uh, join forces, probably we can even go higher than 75,000 jobs. So my question is, can we continue to work together with DY City and advocate and try to push the administration to put more money from the big budget that we have for the summer youth job and other to go a little bit higher than 75,000. Thank you, council member. <laughs> You're welcome, Madam Chair. I know that you had it in your mind also because we are a team. <laughs> so, I, I, Commissioner. No, I definitely look forward to working with you. We wouldn't have gotten to this point without the support of the city council. Um, so we would always, I mean, I don't think any commissioner would ever say we don't welcome additional funding. Uh, it's a proven program, we know it works, and it's an improved model. Uh, but I'm also mindful of the economic reality that the city is facing, and uh, the, the federal government just released its budget, and uh, the headlines I saw were proposed cuts to domestic programs. So again, uh, I'm mindful of the world we live in, who's in the White House, and so, and the, the softening of the economy. So we would welcome additional funding if, if, if it could be identified in the adopted budget. Uh, we're prepared to uh, spend the additional money in the summer youth employment program. But, you know, I'm just mindful of what the, the challenges we face today as a city. Okay, so 
we in the city council and also in the this committee, we're going to work under the leadership of Chair Rose to push the administration and to make sure that we got enough funding for the summer jobs. My last question is that, uh, no, before the last one, <laughs> it seems that, you know, we have, I'm going very quick, there will be 10 new positions for summer youth employment, six program managers, three deputy directors, and one senior program managers. Is that correct? Correct. Yes. But now DYCD will receive less funding. I don't have any, you know, issue with that. You know, we need staff to make sure that the program are running properly. But DYCD will receive less program and we will serve less youth for 2020. Could you explain, explain the reason why you increase uh, the number of staff? Are, the, are we, we going to have 10 more positions? Even with the cut of budget, even we're going to serve less young people? No, I, th I, I don't have any problem with that. I just want to have a. Okay, so I, I think um, there might be some confusion. Our plan is to serve 70,000 young people this summer with baseline funding. The 74,900 and something last year was a result of 5,000, five, um, additional money for 5,000 jobs added in the adopted budget. So if, if, if the council is able to negotiate with the administration to add funding, we will get back to the 75,000. As far as your question about staffing, you had a question about staffing, Andre can talk about that because uh, we've increased the number of programs from 101 to 195, so. Okay. We need more staff. All right. Um, yeah, so as you know, we made the awards public for SYP last, uh, the past couple of weeks. Um, as the commissioner mentioned, we grew the number of awards from 101 to 195. That translates into needing additional staff across the portfolio. Um, as you know, there are nine service options now, so we're moving from four to nine options, which means that you're gonna need folks on your team that are more specialized. Um, for each of the service option. We have on board, we're bringing on board three deputy directors that's gonna provide leadership to our program managers, who's essentially responsible for monitoring, um, providing TA to providers, ensuring that there, if there are any concerns or issues that providers are having around the new model that those concerns are addressed. Um, so essentially in order to really have a high quality program, we make sure that we advocated for additional staff and, that's, and we received that, that number um, and we're happy about it. Thank you very much. Uh, the last one is the last one. Uh, many service providers, they came to, to me and I believe they, 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 they went to the chair also, talking about the stipend versus salary for the summer youth jobs. And we, we, we know that when the young people, they apply for summer jobs, they expect getting some compensation, some money that they will use for themselves and for the family. What can you tell us about that? Because personally, I do believe that those young people should get paid, not a stipend, because they have been going through the school all the year. They deserve a salary. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm sorry about that. This is the last one. I would like you to explain that, that a little bit, uh, you know, why we don't give a salary and how we can give a salary to the young people. Sure. So uh, back in 2017, um, as you know, Council Member, you are part of the um, task force for SYP. And I disagree all the time with it. I'm sorry? I, you know, I was not agree with that. I, you know, I disagree with okay. that. So yeah. um, that was one of the recommendations that um, came out of the task force to um, transition to a stipend model for young people. Um, I think it's important to understand what we're trying to achieve for the younger youth, right? They're gonna be engaged in project-based learning opportunities. And the idea, the idea there is for them to develop the competencies and skills to be successful once you place them with an employer. Um, and when you think about projects, they're gonna be focusing on hands-on um, sector-based learning. So for example, last year, 
we, and we did a number of pilots, as you know, for the past two years to test this model. And we had some really innovative and creative projects that young people worked on. For example, last year, Council Member Rose, you were with us on Staten Island, where we visited UAU's program where the focus was on environmental justice. And, it, and young people were actually in the garden planting and learning about urban farming and what that means for their community. They had guest speakers coming into the classroom, talking to them about the importance of community involvement. So we want to make sure that we spark those interests in young people in a very creative and innovative way. What we also need to understand is that this has become a best practice across the country, and New York City doesn't want to get left behind. In Chicago, they're launching the first ever project-based learning opportunity for younger youth. This has been going on in San Francisco, in Seattle, and if you look at the evaluations that have come out of those programs, the impact are great. So I think I think this is an amazing time for young people to actually start developing the competencies that we want to see them develop to be successful once we place them with an employer. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Chen. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Commissioner and your team. I'm glad that we don't have to do the back and forth because you've been working on getting SONNET baseline and also adult literacy baseline, so we don't have to have that discussion. <laughs> Because we'll be working with you. We still need your help. Of course, of course. But uh, we don't have to put you on the spot. Uh, I have two questions. One is, in your testimony, uh, you talk about the additional $12 million uh, to increase adult liter literacy services. And you said right now only approximate $8 million have been spent. So what happened to the $4 million? Are we going to be on target in terms of spending that? that that's my first question. And the second question is on runaway and homeless youth. In terms of the number of beds for FY19, um, I think the, the target of best supported was 753. Um, from our report, we look like we have certified 606. So are we gonna be on target in getting 753 beds certified? So let, me just, uh, let me do the literacy first. Um, so the 12 million was put in our budget, but 8 million was dedicated for DYCD. The remaining 4 million was for Moya and Department of Education. Mm -hmm. So, Janine, you want to give? Yeah, the funding. Yeah. Hi. Hi, the commissioner is correct. I want to correct the record. It's 11.4 million we received this oh. year, and um, 3 million. It, 3 million of that funding was moved, like the commissioner said, out of the budget. So DYCD currently, like you stated previously, it's about $8.2 million that we have. And the money, uh, the 8 million was based, we, each year we survey the existing uh, providers of adult literacy and ask them how many additional seats can they take on. And then we work with the council to designate groups as well that may not have a, um, a, a baseline contract. And so we try to maximize uh, as much of the money that goes to services, and then the remaining money is reallocated to both the Department of Education and to Moya. And then Susan will ask, answer the question about homeless youth. Yeah, as the commissioner testified, um, we actually we actually brought on a new site as recently as last week. We opened 19 beds to young people, so we have 625 open now, um, 148 pending. Those um, contracts have been awarded. The providers have identified appropriate spaces. The, they're getting them suitable. Um, I'm, I'm looking at the chart that council shared with us, and you can see um, it, back before fiscal year 17, the mayor made a commitment of 300 additional beds on top of the 200. And um, it took, took uh, DYCD goes right into action to do the RFP and issue the awards. But we do know that there is a lag time between when the site is identified and when it's prepared for safety for young people. So we're actually, um, although we have 148 pending, we're, we're in the very last stages with each one of those seven sites that are remaining. The space is identified, they've made progress towards getting to safety, and we do believe that we're on target for the end of, uh, for June 30th. Majority Leader Cumbro. Thank you. I wanted to talk a bit about universal after school. And throughout this country, we know that we are struggling. The vast majority of parents, about 70% work full time from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. But the median closing time for a New York City public school is 2.30. 
which would mean that I should have left here two hours ago in order to pick up my son from school. But thank God he's still in daycare, and that doesn't end till 6 o'clock. But I'm quite worried when he reaches UPK age. Parents who work outside the home, especially mothers, single parents, low-income parents, parents of color, and part-time workers are extremely challenged by no or fee-based after school. Many of these demographics overlap. Right now, schools are designed for families where one parent works outside the home and one parent stays home to care for the children. I personally might love that lifestyle, but that's not my reality. I would love for my husband to be at home waiting for the children while I'm at work. <laughs> The day is coming. <laughs> the reality of the family unit and economic shifts has evolved greatly, and we need to invest in the type of after-school policies and schedules to catch us up to the way people are actually living their lives. Has your agency taken on or thought about or estimated or done a cost analysis of what it would cost to actually expand the school day so that parents can actually live a real life? So uh, let me start, and then Jadine can get, get to the, the budget question. Um, I agree with you on the merits of what you're saying. Um, I've been to more than 50 town hall meetings, I think including one or two in your district. I can't remember now, it's all blur. And by far, the most common question that the mayor gets is, can we expand after school to all the elementary schools in the city? And uh, the question is, can we afford it? And, uh, I, you know, if the money can be found, uh, we, we're certainly prepared to do it. But and I know it's a difficult year, and, and Jadine can give you some uh, ballpark estimates of what it would take to get a program in every elementary school. I hear you if we can afford it. But the question really is, we can't afford it. We can't afford to function in this way um, and to continue to move forward year after year when we know that parents are working two full-time jobs, many overtime, simply don't have enough time to get to and from. And we know if we're expanding UPK and UPK3 and UPK4, and we know that our counterparts in other countries do have a longer school day, we're really lagging behind. We can't afford not to do this. Well, you know, you're, conv you're, you're preaching to the choir. I mean, clearly Sonic has been a big success, and if we can extend it to elementary, I would certainly welcome it. Uh, I don't decide my budget. Um, obviously, it's something that uh, you with the um, administration will have to negotiate, and so if somehow the funds became available, we're certainly prepared to do it. Um, and if you want to know the ballpark, mm -hmm. uh, Judy? Thank you. Thanks, Commissioner. So I, I'm a parent of three, too, so I understand oh, your Oh, God bless you. <laughs> um, but there are ongoing um, conversations and scaling conversations um, um, surrounding um, year-round elementary. Um, I was told not to <coughs> throw numbers out there, but just so, so that you know, I want to put some things out there. Right now, they, we are in 40% of the schools. We're definitely not where we um, want to be, um, and that includes um, 21 century DOE funding in after school. Um, just rough, if I had to throw out a figure, and it's very um, low ball, we're talking about $250 million, um, and that's at the low point. Um, there's still, like I said, a lot of scaling and conversations with OMB, DOE, a lot of partners, and so um, it's definitely under radar. It's something that the administration is you know, looking at. Um, so, you know, we hear you. So if it's 40% that your estimate is, let's just say, is it that you're in 40% of the schools Correct. or that 40% of the children are being served? So we're in 40% of the schools. Um, in total, there are about 984 um, schools, DOE schools, and we're in 40% of them. But we don't know if there is one after school program in that 40% or the entire school has after school programming. If you're asking for uh, an extended day for every uh, student, the price tag would uh, probably be much, much higher. We don't have an estimate, but it's the, the 200 and some, you know, it's much lower. Just to get a program in every school will be costly to get to a point where every young person who wants an after-school seat 
is probably much, much, much higher. I don't even have a number for that. But, you know, there's 1.1 million young people. Uh, so you, uh, the math would be uh, very challenging. So I just want to close on this because I know we're tight on time. But so what you're saying basically is that there's never been an analysis done, uh, a detailed analysis done to determine what exactly is the need. So where there are after school programs that exist, where there are parents that do not need or want after school programming, where children may go to a boys and girls center and their school may not directly require it. So there's never, or there we have CASA programs and those types of programs and the programs that you all run as well, but we've never really understood what the actual need is, so we don't really understand the dollar amount at this time. To my knowledge, we haven't done that uh, because we don't have access to all 1.1 million students. So that would require a much more deep dive working with the Department of Education to really ask every parent this need. I mean, to get to that level of detail, uh, what we can look at is how many schools there are, how many uh, have an after school program either funded by us or by the 20, uh, 21st century state funding. So, but that kind of deep dive, which uh, would require a great deal of effort, I'm sure would yield a much higher dollar amount than the, the amount we're talking about now, which is just to get one into every, the remaining 60% of the schools that don't have an after school program. I just want to say while we don't have this information, and I obviously don't see this anywhere in the budget, and you do agree that there is a necessity for this, and you have three children, God bless you. I don't even know how you're here today. <laughs> wide age group, right? Right, because my son is at home right now with my parents because he has an eye infection. So it's, it's all these different dynamics in terms of juggling and how to make it all happen, but um, if we don't really seriously take this conversation into, uh, into our budget, I feel that we're, we're operating in an antiquated system that's been outdated for more than 30 years that is really causing families an extreme amount of overburden, stress, an inability to be able to save for college because it's expensive. Child care is expensive, especially if you have to pay for after school programming. And this is really not the way for us to build a, a 21st century educational system that's going to benefit our schools and to keep our children competitive in this world. So this is certainly an issue that I want to continue to bring home. The parents are demanding it. The children need it. The council is raising its voice on it. We need universal after school now. Thank you. Thank you so much, council member Cumbo. Um, uh, um, Commissioner, what would it take for you to um, to do a cost analysis of for universal after school? So I want to be clear. I think we have definitely, not I think, I definitely know we have started the conversation. It's definitely a conversation that has been started. Um, as the commissioner mentioned, whether or not we have the funding or not has not prohibited us from starting to dig. So we're we're looking into it it's not that it's in the pie in the sky and we haven't even thought about it and it's not on the radar it's on the radar we know what the scaling inputs are we know who the partners are and the stakeholders are and it just takes collaboration and time to kind of pin down that number so could um could the scaling applied for universal sonic be applied for universal uh compass elementary i mean the thing is, like I said, there's several partners, right? DOE is the owner of the whole, you know, the public school system. And so it's a lot of collaboration, um, a lot of different components, like the commissioner said, and speaking with the parents, and a, a lot of variables that um, are going into it. And the conversation has started. It definitely has started. And since I'm talking to you right now, I want to correct the record. So. Yes, work, learn, and grow traditionally has been um, added by the council. Um, in this last year, it was added through conversations with the council by the mayor, so I wanted to right. correct that one point. And then I crunched numbers as others were speaking, and to get to 5,000 would be about 22.5, so almost $3.4 million more than what we have now. So I just wanted to correct the record on those two things. 
Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Um, and uh, to, to continue with the compass conversation, um, in May of 2018, uh, DYCD released a new RFP for compass, which was subsequently rescinded. Um, why was it rescinded? When was the RFP rescinded? And what was the PPP under that rescinded RFP? And what were the programmatic changes to be rendered under the rescinded RFP? Well, we, when we issued the RFP in spring of 2018, we, um, we hadn't made significant changes to the model. It included some elementary programs and some uh, middle school programs in that RFP. It accounted for about a third of the whole Compass portfolio. And as we got it through the RFP process, the city was hearing a lot of input from not-for-profit not -for -profit providers, a lot of questions about the, um, the cost models and some of the structural models. And I think we, you know, we, we extended and we extended and we had some conversations. And at some point, I think the city just realized we need to step back. Let's cancel this RFP. We're going to take a step back. We're going to engage with the nonprofit community. We've been doing focus groups. We've been asking um, budget questions. And simultaneously, we've extended in all of those sites, we've extended the contracts through um, through summer 20... Uh, June of next year, right? Uh, June of, uh, yeah, a full, a full year, 2020. So we're ensuring that there's no break in service, but we want to get this right. And it may be that we have to issue a concept paper, something that we typically do when we are making substantive changes in the model, but we realize that there were enough questions here, you know, we're going to take that into consideration. So we might do that even before we re-release the RFP. And what was the PPP under the rescinded con uh, RFP? It was 3,738, exactly. Yes, about, yep, about, um, about 3,500 for the elementary and 3,700 for the middle. It was higher than the base RFP that had been issued previously, and I think, you know, that's part of the reason we just hadn't anticipated the amount of pushback that we got. So we're resetting, and we're listening to providers and we'll take our time to get it right. And how are the negotiations going with the providers? Are, well, are they ongoing? Exactly, let me just sort of clarify. So the mayor's office of contract services is actually leading this listening process. So, it's, so we're part of it. So uh, we're waiting to get more feedback from them as to uh, when's the right time to either issue a concept paper or an RFP. So. Okay. Um, you know, so we're waiting to get guidance from the mayor's office of contract services. They have you convened know, these focus groups. What is the groups. timeline for that? So they, they've started meetings. Uh, I would have to get back to you because Mox is the one leading that process. So um, we've asked, council has asked um, in the fall to be a part of the conversation about the shape of the new um, Compass RFP. Um, so. Can, when can we expect to be a part of that conversation? Um, because to date, we have not been. We'll, we'll pass on your request to the Mayor's Office of Contract Services since they're leading this work effort. Mm -hmm. And then uh, they'll get back to you as to what role and what the timing might be. Because we want to be a part of the conversation. Right. And you're saying that it might um, result in a concept paper as opposed to RFP. Right. But we want we want to be there at the beginning of the conversation. So we'll pass on your request to the mayor's office of contract services since they're leading the effort um, uh, of bringing together the different stakeholders. Um, at the OMB hearing uh, last week, uh, Melanie Herzog, um, your budget director, stated that three hundred and twenty-five million dollars have been allocated for fiscal twenty twenty for Compass programs. How many elementary slots will that support? What is the budget for the elementary slots? And how many middle school slots will that support? And what's the budget? And the same for high school. Hi. So let me just grab that quickly. So yes, um, the budget director was correct. We're at 300 and 
25 million. Um, for elementary, we have approximately um, 127.4 million um, to serve approximately 47,000 um, 47, slots. Um, for Sonic, we have approximately 166 uh, million to serve approximately um, 11,900 slots. Um, and in high school, we have about 4.4 million to serve 3,600 slots, all approximations. Hmm? Um, it, um, could, is the base, but on top of that, we have um, yeah. funding for closer to 52,000 in total. Yes, in you were total, the base. yes. Before so, expansion, yeah. I'm sorry, the sonic number seemed to be awful low. Yeah. All right. She, Jadine was giving you like the, um, the, the part that related to the RFP we were talking about, but the, with the mayor's expansion, we're up to about 52,000 in seats and our targets are set even higher than that. Okay. Okay. Um, and, and I just wanna just kind of revisit the mm -hmm. concept of universal compass for um, a, a universal compass elementary program and the need to do some sort of cost analysis so that um, we, can, we can at least have the, start to have the budget conversation, but if we don't even know how much that, that will be, it's hard to, you know, to begin to have that conversation. So we really need for you to do that. Um, um, with um, the runaway and homeless youth, um, I know that you did a uh, the youth count and you this year and you did it differently. So can you tell me what was different, and can you tell me um, how well it went, and do you have a new count yet? Um, and if not, when can we get that? We don't have um, we don't have the numbers yet. We did have a successful um, youth count this year, and that I think we gathered. Um, I don't have the final number of surveys I'm going to get for you, approximately 1,500. I think we gained more surveys than we had in the previous year. And um, I don't, the, the analysis of that will, will take several, several weeks from now. Um, but we added more sites, we added more partnerships so that the, you know, the count, the, the count that happens citywide for you know, street homelessness happens on a Monday night, you know, where we, survey people in the, in, in the streets in the middle of the night. And the youth count, as you probably know, happens on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday after those days. And we find young people where they are because they don't tend to be um, on the streets in the same way that we may see street homelessness in, in older people. And in those questions, we learn, um, were you homeless on the Monday night? Um, and uh, or were you unstably housed also? So we get, we get more data about young people and their homelessness status. And um, yeah, we'll, we look forward to sharing those results with you. Just, just one thing, I, Judine wanted to correct something, but I think one of the big changes we did with the youth count this year, I, th I think Randy Scott talked about it at one of the hearings, mm -hmm. is that we really, for the first time, engaged the school system. Because as you know, there are a number of young people who are either homeless or uh, uh, in, in, uh, temporary housing, and so we had for the first time uh, schools as actual locations to take uh, to, to do surveys of young people. So I think uh, expanding the partnership was very important and bringing in the school system because they re have much broader reach than we do. And then I think we fine tune uh, some places were not good places to reach young people because you're trying to reach young people who are making a point of not wanting to be noticed. So uh, I think. It'll take more than a few weeks. I think my experience has been it usually takes a few months because the d data is crunched by the CIDI. What is yeah. CIDI? Yeah. Center for Innovation C Data Intelligence. Center for Innovation Data mm -hmm. Intelligence, uh, which is out of the mayor's office. They crunch the numbers, and then we'll be glad to share the report when it's available. Wanna? Do we have a sense when that, that's going to happen? A few months. A few it, months. It usually t it takes a while. So, so sorry, correcting the record again. Um, for middle school specifically, because that number that I quoted in slots was definitely too low. So budgeted, we have over 97,000 um, slots. 
elementary about 42,000, middle school about 52,000, that's the record I'm correcting, right. and high school 3,642, so that's the correct number. Sorry about that. Okay, thank you. Um, in uh, the uh, fiscal 2018 preliminary mayor's management report, much of the performance around runaway and homeless youth is measured in terms of the ability to transfer children from crisis shelters into what the, um, what the document describes as a suitable environment. Um, for the sake of the PMMR, how does DYCD define a suitable environment? We, um, I don't have a copy of the 2018 PMMR with me today in, in that you will see that we had taken council suggestions and yours in particular and modified the way that we define suitable environment. Mm -hmm. And at that point, um, there were sometimes one to five young people who had gone into incarceration and they had been counted in that. We corrected that, not just for fiscal year 18, but for the past many years before that, taking that out. It didn't have any substantive change to our numbers overall because it was so small. But we've now defined that we're talking about young people who are going to a known environment. So it might be a young person who's transferred from a crisis program to a TIL program, or it could be that they got their own apartment or supportive housing, or they're reunited with the family. And it's, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's defined more transparently, and we appreciate your feedback on that. We're we're not done with that process. We're engaging with our providers. We're, we're redefining those definitions, and we look forward to more input from you. What is the DYCD's current ratio of crisis beds to transitional independent living beds or till, till beds? I don't know if I know the ratio, but it's, uh, I believe it's 226 crisis. Um, bear with me one sec. Uh, you want, you want, yeah, give me two seconds. I'm, I think it's, I believe okay. it's 226 crisis. And, um, While well, she looks up, is there another question? Sure. Um, in the first four months of fiscal 2018, um, the RHY providers successfully returned 73% of youth ages 16 to 20 either to their families or to a suitable environment, which was slightly down from last year's 74%. What plans do DYCD and the service providers have in place to improve performance, particularly given the vulnerability of our um, youth, sir, um, youth population? Can you give me that number? Can you give me that no those numbers again? The, the number, the 73 percent, um, successfully, providers have successfully returned 73 percent of youth ages 16 to 20 either to their families or to a suitable environment, which is slightly down from last year's 74%. Um, yeah, well, I'll, I can get back to you um, on that change. It, we are serving many more young people as we continue to get free beds online. I don't know um, what impact that had, but we'd be happy to dig into that with you. I'm still trying to find the final number on okay, this. Okay, um, this committee, uh, had an impressive site visit this fall to Covenant House, where young people we spoke with described their experiences upon arriving in a homeless shelter, um, and none of them were informed of where they could receive age-appropriate support. Um, it was a big concern. Many of them landed in adult shelters and being told that, you know, they couldn't be served there but not with any, um, any direction to another facility. Does DYCD believe that you're reaching this population and informing runaway youth where services are rendered? And how does DYCD navigate through, you know, the bureaucratic tangles which prevent accurate communications to desperate youth needing these services? So one of the things we've really focused on is trying to make sure that different networks that we fund are connected. So before um, the programs that funded employment uh, programs for young people who are disconnected did not work with the young people 
who are homeless. And oftentimes, it's the same type of young person. So um, I'm, I'm surprised that Covenant House didn't know about the, all the workforce programs, because many of the other. No, no I'm, I'm not saying that Covenant House okay. did not know. I'm saying the that young people the didn't young know. people. Okay. So we will follow up with Covenant House, because we've made a great deal of effort to connect the groups that provide residential services for homeless young people with the groups that provide employment programs. So I've been on site visits to Queens, for example, uh, Sheltering Arms, where um, the one big issue that always comes up when I meet with young people who are homeless, they want to know about jobs. And so many of the uh, programs are very good at getting young people in the summer youth employment program. And then the, this group, uh, Sheltering Arms, which is based in Queens, started working with a group called Opportunities for Better Tomorrow, which is based in Brooklyn. Because the more we work together as one system, serving the young people, the more uh, impactful we can be. So we'll follow up with Covenant House. I'm a little surprised they didn't educate young people about the different options. Commissioner, uh, um, uh, you're, 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 not, um, you're misunderstanding um, the connection uh, I'm trying to make. Right. Because the young people, um, once they got the Covenant House, the services were there. They were very pleased with it. It's getting to Covenant House, oh, oh, how okay. to find Covenant House. When um, young people are out there, um, they don't know what services are available? What are we doing? We've we've talked about how to make that information more broadly available. Uh, we talked about the possibility of maybe having it at uh, train stations and you know the bus station and, and things where young people who are in crisis and, and in need of a shelter, you know, might might be, might congregate because they find their way somehow to an adult shelter and that's not an appropriate placement, they can't be there and they're not being told where they can go. So, um, you know, it's, it's very concerning to me that the, every young person that we talked to at Covenant House had a hard time finding, you know, that resource. It wasn't it wasn't like a direct path. So I think um, I want to say first, it's 246 crisis beds and 379 till beds for a total of 625 beds online. How many um, crisis service beds? 246 crisis 246. service beds. Yeah, um, mm -hmm. we we have we've heard feedback. From yeah, and then how would someone how do they find also out about know the how to access those beds? Yes, we have um, we heard, heard feedback on this and from others, and we had there was a council bill passed that is um, requiring us to do more outreach. We have. Um, we right now are revising palm cards um, to hand out. I think we're printing like 10 or 15,000 palm cards. They're going to show now that we have not just seven daytime drop-in centers open, but a 24-hour drop-in center in every borough, eight drop-in centers in total, including, as the commissioner said as testimony, we have a new one in Rockaway. Um, we have many, many more sites and beds and services. And so we are, again, the palm cards should be um, printed soon and we will make sure to get a bunch to you. I know you love to get our resource of materials, mm -hmm. postcards mm -hmm. and educational posters. And we've talked about um, when, the, when the text is final, putting, um, using the link kiosks and that kind of thing. So we hear you, we're gonna do a lot of outreach this year for young people. Yeah, I, I really want to see right. that public outreach campaign include our transit hubs, our subways, you know, um, points of entry into New York City. Well, I mean, the other point is that, as you know, we have uh, street outreach programs that work also with the adult street outreach programs from DHS. Mm -hmm. And so it's, hope, it's our hope that these palm cards can be distributed to our programs, which, which go to places where young people who may be homeless congregate at night, as well as the Department of Homeless Services programs, which, which are many more programs. So they may occasionally come across a young person who needs these services. The other thing we've been doing consistently for five years, and it's, um, it's an ongoing process. We, we do regular trainings with the staff at the Department of Homeless Services uh, PATH uh, Center, which is their entry point into their system, so that they know that they can be diverted. Instead of going into the adult system, they can come into our system. So it's, you know, there's always staff turnover, so we're constantly doing training of the staff at the DHS PATH, so that when they show up at an adult shelter, they know they can contact 
an RHY program, and there's usually a vacancy in any given night. So you are working with the DHS um, outreach yeah. street teams? Yes. Uh, and, you know. and they're made aware, even the ones that are a private um, outreach providers? I, I believe uh, Randy Scott at the, at the last testimony uh, said that he's done regular presentations to the DHS funded programs um, so to make sure that they know about the services that are in the youth side because they may come across a young person that is a better fit for our system. And so, and so they we've will been be working given these cards also, right? right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Um, we've been joined by Council Member Rosenthal and uh, I'm going to relinquish the mic so that you can ask questions. Thank you so much, Chair Rose, and thank you for your leadership on behalf of the city's youth. Um, great to see you, Commissioner. A uh, couple of just very quick questions. Um, for the middle school students uh, participating in summer programs, I know this has been asked already, it affects about 300 kids, uh, most high need kids in my district. Uh, do you expect those, the funding for those summer programs to continue? As I said uh, in my earlier uh, question and answer, we asked for the funding for the Sonic Summer programs to be baseline in the plenary budget. I wasn't successful. I will continue to ask for it to be baseline because it's a priority for me to have uh, stable funding for core programs. Sonic program being one of the core programs of DYCD. I know it's a challenge for young people. It's a challenge for working families. They need to know sooner rather than later. So I would continue to advocate and I would welcome any support the council can, can assist in that effort. But it, it is, you know, it's, it's tough to run a program when you don't know when you, whether you have funding until two weeks before the start of the program. So I'm, I'm very mindful of that. I appreciate that. I forgot which side of the table we were on for a second. Um, I really appreciate, yeah, we're all on the same side. I appreciate your advocacy. Um, I've got 90 kids at, uh, I've, 300 kids around all of our NYCHA developments who are at risk of losing a summer program. That's a real concern to me. Um, DYCD, for your shelters, do you provide um, the, men uh, the menstrual hygiene products in those yes. shelters? Yes. And do you find that they're used? Is there a demand? Yes. Mm -hmm. Do you have any problems with funding or anything for those? No. Okay. And do you have, um, for DYCD as a whole, do you have one of the gender equity liaisons? Yes, we have uh, someone who's been on board for, I think, two or three years. And, and what we, role? We, yeah. We have an equity statement. We, we have a plan that's rolling out. So we're actually on target with um, the work of the Gender Equity Initiative. What were some of the bigger findings? Well, you know, one of the things that we, we're always trying to do is trying to make sure that young women have access to the same services. And so a success story is Summer Youth Employment Program. We actually have more young women employed in the summer youth employment program than young men. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, we're trying to strike the right balance, but it's an open process and we, uh, we're trying to look for where appropriate we can do gender specific activities. I think, um, uh, you know, uh, we, and throughout our programs, we're looking for ways to highlight uh, the role of women. So our community development program, I think for the second or third year has a community mom initiative where we ask uh, the nonprofits to nominate women in their communities who are heroines, some, some unsung, some well known, that we can honor during Mother's Day. So we're always looking for ways to integrate this into the day to day work of our programs. You're always looking for ways, or this is a new thing that the gender equity liaison? Uh, it's, I think it's a commitment we've had even before the initiative, mm -hmm. and it, I think the initiative has helped focus it. Um, you know, this year, the um, uh, the focus of the Step It Up campaign is really fighting for LGBTQ rights. Mm -hmm. It's the 10th anniversary of the Step It Up dance competition. It's the 50th anniversary of the Stonewall Uprising. Mm -hmm. And so we want to, again, use this as an opportunity to educate young people and, and community members about the importance of LGBTQ rights. So we're constantly looking for ways to elevate this in all our programs. 
Do you, so you mentioned a plan, this is my last question, Chair. Um, do you, you're rolling out a plan after two years or you have some analysis? We've had a plan and it's and pieces un, un, unfold each year. Great, could you send a copy of that plan over to, sure. our, to the committee? Okay, and it's already been requested yeah. and it was sent over yesterday. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Council Member Rosenthal. Um, uh, just uh, one question, one last question before we get to the public who have been so patiently waiting. Um, um, referencing the uh, PMMR um, performance measures, can you explain why there was a decline of 13% or 9,722 adults in Beacon programs? And can you explain the decline of 23% or 6,156 youth in the Cornerstone programs? Yes. Um, we're going to swear you in again. Good I, saw afternoon. You, I, I saw you put your hand up when they were sworn in. I was in, sworn in. We're going to do it officially. <laughs> okay. Yes. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony and to respond honestly to council members' questions? Yes, I do. And my, state your my name, name for the is Daryl Ratchet. I'm the Associate Commissioner for Youth Services at DYCD. Thank you. Thank All right. You. So for the beacon number, which is the Drop in adults. The drop, uh, the drop in adults, thirteen percent, or so nine thousand seven hundred. Want to definitely start with historically, Beacon programs have served beyond and above their target minimum, um, and that's the case here as well. Um, but in FY eighteen, where those numbers were taken, there actually was a brand new RFP released. Um, in the development of that RFP. We had several meetings, several focus groups, feedback sessions with stakeholders, providers, um, parents, young people to inform the concept paper for that RFP. Uh, once it was created, we had rolled it out, the concept paper, received feedback, and then had another series of just, um, feedback sessions with stakeholders. And then that informed the RFP that released. In the RFP, it actually provides additional and more flexibility for programs to define which young people they are serving, how they're serving them, and to the, the intensiveness of the services being provided. What that saw was a reduction in the minimum target for adults in that RFP. But again, with that being served, said, we are serving higher than the minimum target for adults. So the, by the metrics of the RFP um, required uh, serving less adults? Le less adults, more young, more young adults, more youth. More young, okay. Providing and flexibility for programs to decide which populations in their neighborhoods should be concentrated on, should be, be provided intensive services. Okay, so that was a function of the RFP. Function of the RFP. Okay. But with, again, um, those numbers are still higher than the minimum. And um, the the decline of 23% or 6,156 young people in the Cornerstone programs. So as you know, Cornerstone programs are high in demand and historically similar to Beacons, we've served yeah. over the minimal targets. With that being said, we do see the PMMR number is lower than usual. We are meeting with providers to figure out what went on, what's happening, so we can get to the detail. So we've already met with providers. I anticipate that number increasing, but I don't want to give you sort of the preliminary Were there programmatic changes? Were there budgetary it's, so changes? It, it's a combination of things, but again, I want us to fully vet that out before I publicly say, hey, this is the issue. So there's no speculation. There's like, uh -huh. we, they said this, we took a look at it, we dived deep, and yes, we so confirmed. we have a list of things that we're going to ask you for to provide after this Absolutely. that will be included. Um, and can you ex explain the decline of 35% or 2,872 youth in the Cornerstone programs? The same. We're, we so, are looking at those numbers. Okay. Um, so uh, I, I want to thank you all for, for being here.
Don't don't get don't go so fast, <laughs> Commissioner. <laughs> calm, calm down. I have you know I have to we say something, now. right? All right. <laughs> Um, I, I just want to again say I appreciate your advocacy on behalf of, um, of Summer Sonic. Uh, again, this committee is, is going to push that. Uh, I'm really looking forward to uh, DYCD looking at um, the metrics and a cost analysis of what it would take to do universal after school. Um, I want to make sure that we're on the record that the peg to DYCD does not negatively impact um, programming uh, service delivery to um, our 10 program areas and, um, and we'll be looking for um, information that we're going to send you um, a letter uh, requesting and, and reiterating uh, many of the questions that we asked that we want follow up like to our compass questions with details, the compass RFP, MOX timeline. Um, you know, uh, I can't reiterate how important it is that council is there at the beginning of those conversations with the RFP, the youth count, um, you know, what's happening with our 74% to 73% of our RHY. Um, and uh, you know our cornerstone youth um, information. So we will put all of that in in a document. And um, I want to ask that the response be timely. Um, uh, I really don't want the staff to come back and say we're having difficulty getting the answers. So I want to thank you for your testimony. I want to thank the committee members also. So, um, did you want to say something, Commissioner? Thank you for yeah. your support of, of DYCD. Always, always, we have the same goal. Um, uh, we might not have the same idea of how to get there, but we have the same goal, and that is to serve as many as all of our youth in New York City. And, um, and I don't want them to be the throwaway um, group in New York City. Um, they are our most vulnerable, and they have issues that we have to address. And so, and that spans the gamut. I know the mayor is interested in early elementary um, childhood ed and programming, but it spans that entire gamut. So, I thank you. Could you wrap up this conversation? Um, oh, and someone will stay behind, right, to hear the questions from the public. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just need to clarify because Commissioner Fenor was very good about clarifying. You have been very good about the SYEP um, information. Thank you. Um, listen. <laughs> Do you want to call them? Um, oh, okay. Um, could we have our next panel? Our next panel is Melissa Diaz, American Museum of Natural History, Whitney Dunhauser, um, Jeffrey Golia. Gregory Brenda, Raisa Rodriguez, and Daniel Masood. Manbudi. Manbudi. Um, would you, when you get to um, the, the panel, to could you identify yourself, your name, and your organization? And we're going to um, put you on the clock. So we'll give them three minutes. Is that? We have six. Um, we need two more chairs. <laughs> Hi. 
Yes, you can start. Uh, Jeffrey Golia, Associate Executive Director of Gain Out and Stain Out. Uh, Whitney Donhauser, President and Director of the Museum of the City of New York. Dan Melissa Diaz, Director of Government Affairs at the American Museum of Natural History. I assume I projected, but. Daniel Mambo, I'm with Canva, Program Director for the SYEP program. Hi, good afternoon. Raisa Rodriguez with Citizens Committee for Children. Oh, that's fun. <laughs> You would pick that one. <laughs> Good afternoon. I'm Gregory Brender from United Neighborhood Houses. Hi. Good afternoon. Um, once again, I'm Raisa Rodriguez with Citizens Committee for Children. I'm the Associate Executive Director for Policy and Advocacy. Thank you so much for holding this very important um, hearing. Uh, we have at CCC have analyzed the impact of the administration's preliminary budget and have attached to the testimony our analysis of the impact of um, the, the budget on children and youth throughout the city. Um, there are elements in the budget that we strongly support, expansion of 3K, um, summer youth employment investments, uh, more equitable policy for transportation, um, and so all those things we stand behind and are, are fully supportive. Uh, sadly, however, the budget fails to uh, make significant investments in areas that we know are necessary. Uh, salary parity to make sure there's equity across both CBOs and schools, um, bridging the gap social workers to ensure that there's social workers in schools with high concentration of homeless and transitional students, um, and other areas that we continue to, to have as priorities. Um, we also are fully aware of the challenges of, of um, the economic situation. I know that city agencies are being asked to make tough decisions um, as part of the PEG. And so we, we, are, we recognize all those things um, as we uh, push for our priorities in the budget. I want to definitely um, point you to two, three areas uh, as it relates to uh, the committee. Um, that we strongly urge the administration uh, to include in their executive budget. Uh, summer programming for middle school after school programs, really significant investments to make um, after school for elementary school universal, um, and significant uh, or continued commitment to the city council initiatives that have been quite successful throughout the city and that children and youth continue to um, rely on. So let's start with some programming for middle school students. We are um, incredibly supportive and continue to recognize the great investments that have been made by this administration um, with Sonic. Um, it has been implemented pretty well throughout the city, but for one element, and that's summer, right? Um, we cannot have uh, after school programming that does not include uh, summer programming. Parents do not have, most parents are not teachers, right? And work continues to, to uh, be a significant element in most families' lives in New York City. But not only families, kids themselves need the programming during summer. We know, and the research is clear, I'm sure I'm, I'm preaching to the choir as they say, um, summer learning is quite important. And so ensuring that um, every slot has a summer component, something that we support. Does that mean I have time? Um, so, <laughs> so I know I'm preaching this to the choir. I would also just um, definitely, again, reiterate the need to make after school programming in the elementary level universal um, and thank uh, the council for their continued support um, for these issues and in um, council initiatives that we hope could continue. Thank you.
Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity to speak. Uh, Jeffrey Golia, Getting Out and Staying Out. Um, founded in 2004, Getting Out and Staying Out, also known as GOSO, is a comprehensive reentry program serving 16 to 24 year old young men who've been involved in the criminal justice system. Uh, we work with these young men uh, in the jails in Rikers Island, as well in uh, prisons upstate, and of course when they come home into the community. Um, our uh, community program, located in East Harlem, um, gets uh, referrals from all kinds of folks, including um, city council members. Our recidivism rate is approximately 15%, which is well below the average, um, national average of 67%. Uh, we currently have over 700 participants in our community program. At GOSA, we focus on the three E's, employment, education, and emotional well-being. Uh, our program is tailored to address these core concerns while also providing individual attention to each participant's individual needs and goals. All participants work with a licensed social worker, who, um, all of whom are equipped to provide psychotherapy as well as reentry planning. And every week we run a comprehensive job readiness curriculum that all participants must pass in order to move forward in the program. After that, they're eligible for a number of other uh, programmatic opportunities. Much of the core anti-recidivism programming at GOSO um, is funded through New York City's Department of Youth and Community Development, DYCD. While it's clear that our participants, young men who've made that commitment to change their lives and avoid reinvolvement in the criminal justice system are the ones who put in the hard work, uh, we would not be able to do so, we'd not be able to provide this, uh, this programming without funding um, from departments like DYCD. Uh, GOSO is known for the work we do with court-involved youth, and we often get referrals from other agencies and nonprofits because of that work, again, funded by DYCD. Uh, GOSO is one of the few programs that works with all court-involved young people uh, 16 and 17 year olds included, um, no matter the charges. Our program has an on-site task program run in collaboration with the DOE. Uh, this year we've enrolled 32 participants in our school who are working towards their high school equivalency diplomas. Uh, we also provide support uh, to our participants who are in college and trade school, including Metro cards and books. Uh, we provide monthly vocational trainings, uh, and we also know that employment is a huge goal for our participants. Since 2013, GOSO Works, our employment development program, has placed nearly 500 participants in internship to employment opportunities with local businesses. Approximately 65% of these participants complete their placements, many of whom go on to full-time work afterwards. Recently, we've also had a number of participants accepted into the local 79 Mason Tenders Union. Um, as a staff of mental health professionals, we seek to address the biopsychosocial issues of our participants. Uh, even before their first interactions with the justice system, our participants faced poverty, racism, trauma, and a number of broken systems. And often these issues are exacerbated by the trauma of incarceration. Successful reentry cannot happen without robust emphasis on mental health and emotional well being. Uh, through individual and group therapy, trauma informed interventions, uh, psychoeducation and referrals to more intensive psychiatric services, the staff at GOSO seeks to destigmatize mental health treatment and encourage our participants to prioritize their emotional well-being. And anyway, I appreciate this opportunity to speak to you today. Thank you. Um, do you uh, take referrals from all five boroughs or just Absolutely, you? from all five boroughs, yeah. Okay, thank you. Hi, thank you so much for this opportunity to test testify. I'm Whitney Donhauser from the Museum of the City of New York. The museum is one of 33 organizations within the CIGs. The CIGs are located in city-owned, on either city-owned land or in city-owned buildings, and we work in concert with many partners to provide cultural, education, and community services in a wide variety of ways. We work with all ages and all demographics all over the city. And today I want to provide you with some exciting work that we're doing in engaging with the city's youth and to advocate for funding for the FY20 budget. The Museum of the City of New York presents each year more than a dozen exhibitions and hundreds of adult, family, educator, school field trips, TOTS, and youth programs such as our LGBTQ Teen Summit and free SAT prep classes. One program I'd like to highlight is our internship program that we've been operating since 2012. The program engages eight to 10 youths, ages 18 to 24, who are at a turning point in their lives. They've had ba barriers in their education and careers, but who've demonstrated a desire to grow professionally and to work with children. The interns are recruited in collaboration with local partners like the Stanley Isaac Center, Mount Sinai Adolescent Health Center, The Door, and Exalt. 
The interns are paid and participate in a three-month-long training on education, pedagogies, object inquiry, public speaking, and more. And the interns explore the city, the museum, and learn how to teach. Then they lead the summer programs for thousands of young learners. Their training includes off-site visits to observe and learn from others working in cultural institutions and organizations, such as the Innocence Project at the Brooklyn Museum, Weeksville Heritage Center, the Intrepid Museum, and during the New York City Museum Education, Education Roundtable Conference. On their final days, the interns present their works to local partners and leaders, and we're thrilled to have our East Harlem Council Member, Diana Ayea, speak with the students in the last session. Alumni go into college or they complete their high school equivalency program. Some have continued to work in the museum shop as IT interns and assisting with family and community development programs, such as the Africa Center's neighborhood celebration, and some return as mentors to the newest cohorts of interns in the following year. Um, some of our other CIG colleagues provide equally important programs, including the Brooklyn Children's Museum free after school program at PS 189, a Title I public school program in Brownsville, Queens Botanical Summer Youth Employment Program host to 30 to 45 young people for six weeks working with horticulture maintenance and visitor services staff. In 2017, the CIGs, with many others, partnered with the city to produce Create NYC, the city's first cultural plan. The plan is ambitious and focused with areas seeking to have an impact on equitable access to and participation in arts and culture. The plan aligns with existing programming at museums, botanical gardens, and zoos all over the five boroughs. So we continue, with continue, continued city funding, these programs can be counted on, and with additional funding, they can be expanded. So the CIG requests $30 million in the city budget in order to reach our equivalent funding in FY uh, 2009. So we hope that we'll be able to keep that same level of funding. Thank you. Thank you. Um, are you also referring to CASA money? I'm referring it, to what? Do you, do you get, are you also referring to CASA money? After school uh, uh, No, funding? we don't receive okay. any, I don't have anything on after school okay. funding, no. Thank you. You might though. Okay. Okay. Good afternoon, uh, my name is Melissa Diaz. On behalf of the American Museum of Natural History, I'd like to thank you, Chairwoman, and the committee for welcoming us to discuss the museum's role in shaping the lives of New York City youth, particularly through our science education programs. Many of you may already know the American Museum of Natural History as a place where youth gravitate. Maybe it's a place where you visited as a child or where you brought your own children, grandchildren to learn and explore. Here in the middle of New York City, our youth can explore everything from the elements of the cell to the expanses of the universe. They can travel to the past to see prehistoric mammals, and they can see and learn about the future of the planet that they will inherit. We welcome half a million New York City school children to our halls every year through school and camp groups, and they get to experience all of this for free, free time travel, imagine that. This year, the museum is celebrating 150 years of being a beacon for science education in the city. Since our founding, our mission has been to impart knowledge about human cultures, the natural world, and the universe. The museum continues to uphold this commitment to education through the rich arrays of programs that we offer to the public, from toddlers to PhD students. All of these programs are structured to align with state and city and state educational standards and benchmarks so that we can increase scientific literacy and encourage students to pursue science-related careers. I think we all know that now more than ever, we live in an era of constant scientific discovery and technological change, which directly affects our students. As our economy increasingly depends on revolutionarily new advances, thousands of STEM jobs remain unfilled here in New York City. We believe our students should have the scientific career training to be able to obtain those jobs right here at home. If we wanna stay competitive as a nation and a city, we need to build a scientifically literate citizenry, pardon, citizenry <laughs> and a bank of highly skilled STEM literate young adults from all bank backgrounds. The city has begun responding to this need by making unprecedented investments in STEM learning. At the museum, we're doing our part every day by providing accessible, affordable science education programs to over 2,400 New York City students so they can access rigorous science education and meet the demands for the jobs of the future. 
through our Bridge Up STEM program, young women in high school are learning how to code in Python, they're working on real scientific data sets, and they learn how data science and data visualization are important tools for scientists in all fields. In our summer camps, elementary and middle school students are introduced to a wide variety of scientific disciplines through thought-provoking, hands-on investigations, and the use of digital programs and skill building. And in our Discovery Days program, 1,200 NYCHA residents are joining us for Saturdays throughout the year to explore the museum, engage in scientific conversations, and use scientific tools together to learn as a family and interact in a hands-on fashion with the many fascinating objects on display. We are asking for the council support this year for our museum's educational programs and STEM workforce development training, specifically for our after-school program, which provides high school students with free advanced science education, our SALT's internship program, which introduces high school students to careers through science and paid internships, and our museum education and employment program, which gives college students on-the-job experience alongside scientists through paid internships. Last but not least, my time is up, so I will leave you with one, a few words from a MEEP alumna who said she knew very little about STEM as a whole before starting the program. It was never really on my radar. At school, there is very little exposure to such careers. At the internship, it felt like the gates opened to this new world of careers that exist. It was at the internship where I truly learned what STEM has to offer and where it could take me. I ask for your support this year to help us continue creating a place where we can offer science education for another 150 years. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Rose and members of the committee, my name is Daniel Manboat. I am the Program Director for Canberra's Summer Youth Employment Program. I want to thank you for holding today's hearing and affording us the opportunity to testify. Canberra is one of New York's largest and most trusted community-based organizations and is unique among peers, agencies in scale, quality, and resourcefulness. Uh, Campbell was founded in 1977 as a Merchants Block Association. The agency has grown in direct response to the needs of the Brooklyn community and beyond. Today, Campbell provides services to 45,000 individuals and family annually through our integrated set of six program areas, economic development, education and youth development, family support, health, housing, and legal services. Through our comprehensive uh, continuum of services, can provide people with the tools and resources they need to achieve their full potential. Today, I would like to address the committee's, uh, committee regarding the need for adequate resources for the new SYP model. Canberra has been an SYP provider since 1995. Last year, through SYP, we served over 1,400 youth who worked a collective total of over 200 hours and earned over 2.6 million in wages. CAMBA has established deep and effective relationships with diverse no numbers of work sites to provide our youth with meaningful employment experience, including 59 work sites for younger youth and 106 for older youth, totaling 165 work sites altogether. We are grateful to have, we are grateful to have a SYP provider for nearly 25 years, and we greatly appreciate having been awarded n new contracts to serve younger youth and older youth. However, CAMBA has concerns related to both of the contracts we received. For our younger youth contracts, we are concerned about the project-based learning model required for this population. We are troubled about the new responsibilities that are required by the contract without significant increases in funding. For example, younger youth uh, provide, or sorry, our act with an increase of staffing time from five to 15 hours per week. To account for the project-based learning, more of staff will now be responsible for curriculum development for the project-based learning activities. Providers are also asked with finding more space to accommodate the project-based learning activities, which will result in an increase in total rent. In addition, providers will be responsible for attracting younger youth participants without the initiative of a summer job. The younger youth model provides participants with stipend at a rate that's 51% less than if they had paid uh, last year's minimum wage. Finally, we are concerned that the option for actual work experience, the hard skills that come with summer jobs, is not included as a program element under this contract, depriving participants of valuable learning opportunities. <laughs> with regards to the older youth contract, Canberra, Canberra served over a thousand younger youth. We would like 
uh, in closing, I would like uh, two key recommendations. First, we urge DYC to increase the rate which younger youth are paid. In my opinion, younger youth will be paid the minimum wage as they would have received in the previous years. Secondly, providers will be required a higher unit cost uh, for younger youth. 600 per month is not adequate for such a service-rich labor-intensive model. I thank you for your time. Thank you, and um, do you have a copy of your testimony? Yes, ma'am. Okay, could we get? Yes. Okay, Gregory? Good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to testify. And uh, Council Member Rose, Council Member Chin, Council Member Rosenthal, and uh, some of the members of the committee who aren't here, thank you all for being such passionate champions for youth over the years. You know, being there, uh, fighting for the summer camps, fighting for SYP, um, the youth, the, the services for youth in, real, in New York City have really improved through that, thanks to your leadership. Um, so I have long testimony that I'm not gonna read. Um, but I'm really glad that most of these things were actually asked about in the hearing, so I'm just gonna add a little on several areas. Uh, so starting with the compass rates, and uh, thank you for asking questions about those. Um, the compass rates, uh, we wanna make sure, we really appreciate MOX and DYCD actually taking time to do an engagement with the community on this. Um, a few of the things that we wanna make sure that they uh, take into account when uh, addressing these rates are, um, a disparity in funding levels based on whether a program was originally in an RFP back in the days of OST in the Bloomberg administration or whether it was once council, council funded. There's now a $400 differential for programs that were that are either currently or were formerly council funded and baselined. Um, ensuring the full implement, implementation of indirect rates and the COLA increases. Um, ensuring that the co costs of an increase in minimum wage are covered. And lastly, ensuring that the cost of an increased threshold for employees being exempt from overtime is covered. On January 1st of this year, state labor law changed, um, increasing the threshold for which an employee can be exempt from overtime. Many of the directors of after school programs, which particularly in the summer, do run longer than a traditional work day, um, are actually currently at salaries lower than the exemption rate. Uh, so we wanna see funding coming in to ensure that those salaries do get up to the rate for exempt uh, since these are actually director level staff. Um, with regard to uh, Sonic, um, we really appreciate all the council's leadership and advocacy. Just wanna put in a push that we hope this funding uh, can come in the executive budget so that providers have time to uh, get the programs running, make sure that the staff are cleared, make sure the uh, youth are enrolled, and make sure parents actually know uh, before the summer starts that uh, summer programs are gonna be available. Um, with regard to expanding Compass, it was really great to hear those questions and to hear DYCD um, also thinking about it. One other metric that I think they should consider is not just the schools that don't have it, but also how many schools uh, do have Compass but have wait lists in their programs or that have um, actually other programs that are often fee for service in the same school uh, to cover the uh, gap in service. And lastly, with regard to SYP, Oh, no, not lastly, second to lastly, um, with regard to SYEP. Um, one thing we've been hearing a lot of um, that's pretty concerning is that in the awards, um, a lot of programs actually got significantly uh, less older youth slots and significantly more younger youth slots uh, than they applied for, and therefore actually significantly fewer y older youth slots than they have served in the summer of 2018. Um, there's a lot of concern, as you heard from Daniel, about the implementation of the younger youth model, which becomes harder if you're actually doing it at a greater level than you applied for, than what you thought you could do. Um, and then there's an incredible need for 16, 17 year olds to, uh, to participate in SYP. And lastly, we strongly support the uh, restoration and the continued expansion of Work Learn and Grow. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, Council Member Rosenthal has a question. Thank you. Um, thank you all for coming in today. Thank you for the work that you do on behalf of our kids. Gregory, I think this is mostly to you because you have this sort of umbrella point of view. Could you talk a little bit more about the exempt employee overtime issue and um, <clears throat> how many human service providers you think it, it could affect? Sure, and I actually have to look at the numbers on here. Um, so for organizations of more than 11 employees, it rose to um, 1125 per week or 58,500 annually uh, to hit the level of exempt. 
Um, so there's a lot of areas, um, senior centers, um, after school programs, uh, NORCs, where very often the directors um, are actually at late rates lower than that. And so they are traditionally going, they are reasonably expected to be working more than a 35 hour week um, and therefore eligible for overtime. Uh, but right now the contracts don't account for either increasing the salaries to that 58.5 level or um, ensuring that there's funding for overtime. And that's a state, a new it's state? A, it's a state law, yeah, or it was a, I think it's a reg state regulation that went into effect uh, January 1, 2019. And did the state put in any additional funds for that, for their portion? Uh, for their portion? contracts? No, no, they haven't. That's, Shocker. that's something we're up in Albany talking about, <laughs> yeah. So it's an unfunded mandate? It is an unfunded mandate, yes. Okay. And um, we'll ask at the Human Services uh, Council if anyone's putting together numbers of how much that might cost the city or state if we were sharing the cost. Yeah, I don't, I don't have that number, and I, I imagine it probably even goes beyond human services. Yeah. Uh, but it's something that's, that's really present in, in human services. Similarly, I heard you talk about indirect costs and the um, increase in wages. Mm -hmm. um, have all of those increases been modified now into the agency, the nonprofit budgets, do you think? Um, we last did a survey of, survey of this over the summer, and we'd found, I think, some, like, I think there was still somewhere over 40% in just, just in Sonic and Compass, because we were just looking at Sonic and Compass, had actually not been implemented yet. That was actually part of the reason for the, uh, the problems with the Sonic Compass RFP, because it based the total amount of money uh, not on what the indirect rates would be if it were fully implemented, but what the indirect rates were at the point it was issued, which was in like June of 2018. That doesn't make any sense. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> Did you notice that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's, um, that's really bad. So just because they weren't able to technically get the indirect rates amended into the contracts, they issued new RFPs with the previous years? Yeah, so what it, what it looks like they did was essentially take the amount of money being spent, which included indirect rates for a lot of organizations, but not all of them, add it all together, and then divide by the number of, of slots. Um, so since that didn't account for programs that um, didn't get their rates yet, right. um, it ended up being lower. And, and it, was, it was those organizations that had already received their indirect rates who really noticed this because when they looked at their numbers, um, essentially the law of averages caused their numbers to go down and they would be looking at a cut. And you know, it's, uh, as, as, as you know, it's really the, the process of implementing the indirect uh, rate increase is, is very challenging. It requires a lot of um, uh, administrative uh, work um, that some agencies were slow at and then it requires a lot of work on the city side, it wasn't always completed by the time the city issued that RFP. Are you part of the city's, um, the mayor's resiliency committee? Yes. Nonprofit. Are they talking about this issue in the working group? Yes, this issue is in, I think, all the working groups, yes. Have they made an offer to fix this problem? No, no, then there hasn't been, to my knowledge, a, a budget uh, move from that. Okay, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you all. Thank you, council member, uh, really great questions. Thank you all for the work that, that you're doing. Um, please make sure that we get your testimony because we want to incorporate it in our budget response. So thank you again. No, you could probably see better now because yeah. you can see up close. Yes. Sorry. Okay. Maureen Fonseca. Sports and Arts and School Foundation, Tatiana Arguello, UAU, uh, Sean Daly, NYJTL, uh, Margam Olat Unde, Sadie Nash Leadership Project, Chitra Iyer, Sadie Nash Leadership Project, and Michael Coughlin, Big Brothers and Big Sisters of New York City.
Okay. Um, state your name and your organizations, and you can begin the test your testimony. Which way do you want to start? We started from that end before. You want to start this end? Uh oh. Or, or should we do ladies first? Your call. Ladies first. Yeah. We'll do ladies first. This is uh, um, Women in History Month, and the other day was International Woman, and, and you have two Women Caucus members here, so we, um, we'll defer what? to the ladies. No, we'll start with the ladies. Okay. State your name and your organization, please. Mary, I'm Alatsunde. I'm from Sadie Nash Leadership Project. Good afternoon. My name is Mary Alatsunde, and I am a high school senior and proud Nasher. That means a participant in Sadie Nash. Thank you to the committee, particularly Chairwoman Rose, for being willing to listen to the voice of young people like me. Chairwoman Rose comes from the best borough of New York City, even though we're unknown a lot of, a lot of times, Staten Island, and I'm so proud that you represent our community. You're definitely a role model for me. Also, I am excited because it is my 18th birthday. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, happy birthday to you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Sadie Nash Leadership Project provides young women with leadership programming so that we can make change in our life and in the world. Three years ago, I moved to Staten Island from Nigeria. Everyone, everything was new to me. When I popped my mouth, I felt like people couldn't understand me and were making fun of my accent. So I tried to speak as little as possible. My cousin told me I should do this things called Sadie Nash. So I signed up for the Summer Institute. It was really fun to travel to the new school from Staten Island, and it was the first place that I felt welcome. I learned about feminism, power, and race, and gentrification, and leadership. I was excited to speak and proud of my accent. Since then, I have gotten to do a paid internship and learn career skill and get support with the college application process. Not just pa the paperwork, but the em emotional journey as well as I have learned about mental health and tools to manage stress. Sadie Nash received funding from the city council through an initiative called Star Girls Stage CGI. Because of Stars, Sadie Nash now has a summer institute, not just for not just at the new school in Miami, but also in Brooklyn and Queens. I hope very soon in Staten Island. Because because of Stars, Sadie Nash offers partnership classes all over the city to young people. We can come to regular programming like cuts involved youth, pregnant and parenting teens, English language learners. I even connect with them. And we, I connected them with my high school, Curtis High School. They will do a class there because a lot of young people can come to the city. My aim. I feel really lucky. I found Sadie Nash. I don't know what I would do otherwise. I definitely think I would. I wouldn't be. I would be accepted to college, and I don't think I would be comfortable speaking out about my immigration right as a new immigrant myself. Okay, in the, in a city like New York that has so many resources, I don't think you should have you should have to be lucky to get a spot in program like City Nash. Every young woman, particularly low income young women and gender expansive youth of color, deserves an opportunity to be in a place where we can valued we are valued and loved. City Nash didn't prepare me to become a leader. It told me I am a leader and. It's made me believe in the message on this T-shirt that says this is what a leader looks like. And it's, and I think it would be a very, it, it would be a good, it would be good for New York City to have more young women who recognize and act on their leadership. 
So I am asking you to support the request of City Nash and eight other Great Gale 7 nonprofit to increase this year's star CGI funding to 1.65 million so, so that each organization can do even more for young women like me. Thank you for listening to my testimony and for spending part of my birthday with me. <laughs> Thank you for testifying and I gave you additional time because I took some of your time <laughs> saying happy Thank birthday. You. Happy birthday. Thank you. Yeah. Hello, my name is Tatiana Arguello. I'm with United Activities Unlimited. First, I want to thank uh, the Committee on Youth Services, particularly uh, Councilwoman Rose, who is my councilwoman. And um, a little bit about UAU uh, for the last 15 years. Yes, we're in the house. <laughs> so uh, for the last 15 years, uh, UAU has been running the Summer Youth Employment Program. And I wanted to thank you guys for all the support that you've done to advocate on our behalf uh, and a lot of the issues that we have seen in the models. Particularly today, uh, I think there are still two agenda items that we uh, can work on together. The first is the Work Learning Grow Program, and then the second is uh, the Community-Based Initiative. So I'll start with the Work Learning Grow Program. Uh, we actually just finished the Work Learning Grow Program for this year on March 1st, and uh, it has been my third Work Learning Grow Program that I've been a part of, and uh, I would say, honestly, is one of the best uh, programs in the portfolio. It allows our youth to have 22 weeks of paid internship experience and it also allows my staff to also have more in-depth conversations with the youth that we serve and to better provide them with opportunities. Not only does the Work, Learn, and Grow program provide our interns with much needed experiences because as we know the Summer Youth and Program is very imperative to have, but it's not a long time period to really get in-depth skills and for employers to really have the experience to get to know who their interns are. So over the course of the 22 weeks, we actually see that a lot of our interns are getting hired in these work sites because there's that actual connection, right? And there, and also with our actual interns, we notice that they're more uh, responsive to the commitment that they're making in this internship because it is more than just a six-week program. Uh, so it is not only just something that it keeps some money in their pocket for the 22 weeks, it's something that they actually are engaging with. Um, there are some testimonies that I have provided on the back of my testimony, just kind of giving some feedback that we have from our actual participants. The second uh, thing I would like to bring up is also in the under the RFP, we have the traditional community-based model, the YY and the OY model. And in this, it outlines that the, the slots for these two programs are going to be dwindling down over time and going to be replaced uh, with the, the school-based models. While I do agree with the school-based model, I do see it, it very problematic that we are cutting down on the funding for YY and traditional OY slots as not everyone is a DOE student and not everyone would have the opportunities to gain access to the Summer Youth Improvement Program uh, I am a summer youth improvement program, uh, you know, participant myself, and I've seen the impact uh, that it gives, especially to those who are immigrants and uh, uh, low-income communities, uh, because it allows us to get some experience for the first time. So thank you, and I hope that um, you would continue to read. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Madam Chair and uh, our co committee members here um, for the long-standing support of Sports and Arts and Schools Foundation, SASF. My name is Maureen Fonseca and I am the CEO of SASF, which is now known as New York Edge, and we'll officially roll into that name after this budget cycle. So we are seeking $1.5 million in citywide funding under the Council's After School Enrichment Initiative. This re uh, request does represent an increase of 500,000 over what we received in the fiscal year 19 budget. Now in our 27th year, SASF was founded in 1992, but at the suggestion of the council itself, uh, the council speaker at the time, in order to provide free summer sports, arts, and academic programming to the youth in the city. Since then, the, with the council as our 
partner, SASF has become the largest school-based provider of free after-school and summer programming in New York City, annually serving over 35,000 um, students uh, citywide. We provide programming in 42 of the 51 council districts, operating 317 programs uh, last year in, in fiscal 18. So we are seeking this increase in order to extend and bring SASF programming, which the parents love and the principals give us high marks for, to every council district in the city. Um, we also need to meet the rising costs that have been discussed today um, of existing summer camp programs and um, other programs throughout the year and um, increase our budgets to reflect actual operating costs, to increase the hours of service as well because parents need a full day and we would like to be able to pr provide every city council camp an increase of 20% um, in terms of the hours served as well as to introduce new STEAM programs to every city council camp. We do have some of these and they're doing amazing work and um, we're part of the girl empowerment movements as well, but also engaging every child so that they can see themselves as, as technologically um, engaged and doing exciting projects. Our mission is to help bridge the opportunity gap for New York City students by extending the school day and year with activities designed to improve New York City ch children academic performance, health and wellness, attitude towards school, self-confidence and opportunity for lifelong uh, employment. And so we are seeking, the majority of our youth are um, black, Hispanic, Asian, and new immigrant populations, also homeless children, from the highest poverty neighborhoods in the city. And we are studying the correlation of our programs with um, uh, improved academic results. And uh, we've really become known for very high quality programming and we share with other CBOs what we know, uh, what we have been learning and studying and documenting. So in order for us to keep innovating, I ask you on behalf of the 35,000 young people that we serve citywide to support our FY20 funding request of 1.5 million. Thank you so much for adv advocating for us. Good afternoon, Madam Chair. Councilmember Rosenthal and staff. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak on behalf of the New York Junior Tennis and Learning, NYJTL. My name is Scott Daly and I am the director of our citywide free community tennis programs. <clears throat> I've handed in my testimony and I'd rather not read it if you don't mind and just speak to you from what I know and what I feel about our program. Um, New York Junior Tennis League currently serves every single council member district in the city of New York. We are in all 51 council districts. We dove into the stats a little bit more into the data. We serve 174 of the 178 zip codes in the city. Two that we don't serve are forts. There are no residents in them, and two are just totally self-contained. Right now, we have programming all 12 months of the year. We are now in the indoor season, we go spring, summer, and fall outdoors. Those programs run on average seven to nine weeks. Right now, we serve 85,000 kids through two separate branches. One is a free community tennis program, which I'll get into. The other is something called school time tennis. We teach teachers how to bring tennis into the schools during the school day. We provide them with all the training, the curriculums, the lesson plans, the equipment, the balls, the nets, the rackets. What we hope for is to put a tennis racket into hands of kids who would otherwise never be exposed to tennis. From there, we want to get them into our free programs outdoors. We are not restricted. We are open to all, 5 to 18 years of age. Our demographics, when you look at the testimony, our testimony, it's broken down almost equally between blacks, Latins, and Hispanics, about 25, and Latinos and Asians, about 25% each. 75% of our population comes from there. 70% are 10 and under. These are the kids that we need to serve. 
We are offering tennis because of the council's continuing support to groups of kids who otherwise would never have this chance. It's that tennis, as some people know, as we all know, is something that would be associated with the affluent, kids of money. We are bringing it to everybody through every corner. Let me get right down to the numbers. For the past 11 years, we have received, our budgets have been constant throughout. We have stayed flat. Ch it's challenging. It, it's, it's almost impossible for us to continue to keep on doing it at that current funding as in the last 11 years. We are asking, we are seeking this year $1.2 million. This will allow us to meet, number one, the new minimum wage of $15. 11 years ago, the minimum wage was at less than $7 an hour, and yet we have remained flat throughout. We want to continue to serve every council district. We want to increase the hours. We want to increase the number of kids. On behalf of all the kids of the city of New York, I want to thank you very much for your continued support. I look forward to you answering any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Elliot Berger, and I'm the Chief Development Officer for Big Brothers Big Sisters of New York City. Um, I'm humbled to be here and thank you, uh, Councilmember Rose and the Youth Services Committee for having me uh, to testify and for your past support of our efforts. Uh, Big Brothers Big Sisters of New York City provides a suite of mentoring and youth development services throughout the five boroughs for ages seven and up. Our mission is to ensure that all youth have access to mentors, and we have been doing this since 1904, matching youth in New York City with carefully screened and professionally trained adult mentors, who we call bigs, to help them reach their full potential. For the 2020 city budget, we request a $1.2 million in discretionary funds for Big Brothers Big Sisters of New York City's initiative, which will serve 1,400 youth. That's 600 through our one-to-one -one mentoring programs and 800 youth through our college and career programming. Last year, we served nearly 6,000 youth citywide. In the past five years, on average, 98% of our youth graduate high school, of which 92% are admitted and enrolled into college. Almost three quarters of them are the first in their families to attend college. Um, to ensure that all New York City youth have access to our programs, we have satellite offices in the Bronx, Queens, and Staten Island for our community outreach and recruitment efforts. More than three quarters of the youth we serve come from low to moderate income families, and more than half come from single family, uh, single parent guardian households. More than one third come from new American families. And they're supported by our staff in Spanish, can Cantonese, Mandarin, and Korean. Additionally, uh, in addition to the College Success Program, which allows uh, access and persistence in college, uh, we have launched our Big Pride initiative to provide mentoring for our city's LGBTQ plus youth. And we've also launched a Bigs and Blue program, which engages New York police officers as mentors for middle school youth. Our work is invaluable to the youth, families, schools, and organizations we serve. Restoring funding from the city council will enable us to build and support mentoring relationships that ignite the biggest potential futures for our youth. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. I want to thank you all for the work that you're doing. Um, it's, it's documented that um, when we make an investment in our young people, it does have a significant impact on their lives, academically, socially, you know, um, all of the psychosocial areas. And so I, I want to thank you for the time that you, you invest and that it's not lost on us how important the work is that you do and, um, and how important the money is too. <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you. you all. Okay, the next panel. Uh, Jamie Polovich, Coalition for Homeless Youth. John Sintagar, Covenant House. Rita Finkel, the Armory Foundation. John Connolly, Greenwood Cemetery. Vivian Santora, Power Play NYC. Arshay Cooper, Rowe, New York.
As soon as you get there, identify yourself <laughs> and your organization and jump right in. Thank you for allowing me uh, here to speak today. Uh, my name is John Connolly. Uh, good afternoon, Chairman Woman Rose and members of the committee. I'm the Director of Public Engagement and Development at Greenwood Cemetery in Brooklyn. Of all the cultural institutions you'll hear about today, I feel pretty certain this is the first and only time you'll hear about a cemetery. Uh, but the cemetery is a national historic landmark. Uh, Greenwood Cemetery in Brooklyn spans 478 acres and borders Sunset Park, Windsor Terrace, Borough Park, Kensington, Park Slope, Prospect Park South, and Ditmas Park. Uh, Greenwood Cemetery has been in Brooklyn since 1838, and you know it as the final resting place for hundreds of thousands of New Yorkers. But what you may not know is that we present over 200 public programs, tours, and events every year. Last year alone, over 280,000 people came to Greenwood to attend a program to visit or just stroll the historic landscape to get away from the urban grind. To serve New York City youth, we have developed a strong lineup of programs, one of which is in workforce development. We train young people from low-income communities in masonry restoration for jobs in restoring historic buildings with a direct path to union apprenticeships and union jobs. We run an environmental justice program for school-age students in Sunset Park, which involves uh, street trees and Greenwood's horticulture staff. We give school tours for over 4,000 elementary and middle school students a year. In 2019, under the direction of a new director of education, we're developing new curricula, hiring a team of part-time educators, and developing a Title I partner school program and more to expand and deepen our school offerings. A renowned high school summer internship program in research and restoration has been in the press recently for its work on Greenwood's Freedom Lots, which are seven public burial lots, which we now know make up the largest original 19th century black burial ground in the five boroughs. At Greenwood, we have a bold vision. It is to establish the cemetery as a major cultural and educational institution in New York City within the next 10 years, and we're well on our way. We are a huge resource to the community. We want to serve more New Yorkers with public programs, serve more schools, more students, and more young people. Our planned education and welcome center is the key. This is a capital project directly across the street from the cemetery's main entrance at the corner of 25th Street and 5th Avenue between Sunset Park and South Slope. This new center will house uh, research archives as well as classroom space and mixed use space to further enhance and expand our programming. Its budget is $34 million. One third of the funding will come from private philanthropy, one third from the cemetery itself, and we are targeting city and state funding for the last third. Our FY20 capital ask of the Brooklyn delegation is $1 million. Greenwood has been in Brooklyn for 181 years, but it is an entirely new and cultural education asset as part of the borough that is significantly underserved. We hope very much to work with the City Council on this important initiative. Thank you for your time. I just want to say I'm probably the only one here that can appreciate a cemetery. Okay. My grandparents are undertakers. <laughs> very nice. Thank you. Good afternoon and deepest thanks to the City Council's Youth Services Committee for your attention today. My name is Rita Finkel and I am the co-president of the Armory Foundation. I'm delighted and honored to have this opportunity for those of you who are not familiar with the Armory to introduce you to the home of the National Track and Field Hall of Fame and the fastest track in the world. Wanted to take a few moments to highlight some of the things that happen at the Armory. Our mission is keeping kids on track and we are wild about track and field. Track and field accommodates all body types and temperaments, and running is not only the basis of many sports, but it is a sport you can do for the rest of your life with only a pair of sneakers. Through it, we are able to touch so many lives in a meaningful way. Thousands of New York City high school students call the Armory home for both training and competitions. On a Tuesday or Thursday night from mid-November through the end of March, we will welcome up to 1,500 athletes that come to train with their coaches and teams from over 80 public, independent, and parochial schools of New York City. 
100 meets happen in those months with some of our larger high school meets involving up to 6,000 athletes. In 2017, we piloted Little Feet, a new program that attracted over 200 elementary school children from Washington Heights, Inwood, and Harlem to run, jump, throw, and giggle twice a week from October through the middle of May. This year, it continued and expanded to include children in grades two through five. In addition to Little Feet, we have a long-running program for middle school children. The City Track program has been offered at the Armory for almost 17 years, imparting the joy of moving and promoting healthy habits for children in grades six through eight. Both City Track and Little Feet are offered at no cost to the families of our participants. So you do not get the idea that all we do is fun and games. We also work with our track athletes to help them gain acceptances into great high schools and four-year colleges with the funding to make a college degree a reality. Armory College Prep is an unscreened, dynamic after-school program that puts students on track for lifelong success by helping them to and through college. College choice exploration, test prep, college visits, personal statement creation, financial aid counseling, application and testing fees are all covered by our sponsors of Armory College Prep. For both of the last two years, 100% of our seniors were admitted to four-year colleges. Williams, Amherst, Cornell, Haverford, Dickinson are just a few of the colleges that have admitted the students of Armory College Prep. In the 1980s, the Armory was a homeless shelter. 1,000 homeless men lived on the space that is currently the track. The film the, Saint of Saint, the film, The Saint of Fort Washington, with Matt Dillon and Danny Glover, was filmed at the Armory. A few years ago, I was doing a tour with a scout from Cirque du Soleil, and I looked at her, over at her, and tears were streaming down her face. I paused to ask her if she was okay. She looked at me and said, I was on the crew that filmed The, Fort, the Saint of Fort Washington and cannot believe the transformation. Let me finish. The New York City Council has historically been tremendously instrumental in supporting our growth. I am here today asking for your continued support to help keep the Armory running. And let me finish with an invitation to come visit. We have 100 track meets per season showcasing the entire range of track and field participants. Our educational programs run year round and we also have a list of special events outside track season. Many, many thanks for your attention. Good afternoon. My name is John Centigar, and I'm on the advocacy team at Covenant House New York. Um, I want to thank the Committee on Youth Services, Councilmember Rose. I know you recently came for a visit. Um, we were really happy to see you. Um, in 2018, Covenant House served over 2,000 young people in our residential programs and through our drop-in center and street outreach efforts. We provide shelter every night to approximately 120 young people, including pregnant women and mothers with their children, LGBTQ youth, and commercially sexually exploited youth and trafficking survivors. Many of our youth have experienced abuse or neglect at the hands of parents or caregivers, and a disproportionately high percentage of our youth struggle with the pervasive impacts of trauma, mental health issues, and substance use. We provide young people with food, shelter, clothing, medical care, mental health and substance use services, legal services, high school equivalency classes, and other educational programs, job training programs as well. All of these services help young people overcome the trauma of abuse, homelessness, and exploitation, and move towards stability. We're requesting assistance through the City Council for FY20 on a range of initiatives. I just want to make you aware of those. Um, and they include LGBTQ youth mental health. Uh, we're requesting money from the City Council to support the enhancement of our mental health programs that are specifically tailored to the needs of LGBTQ youth. Um, it's critical that we provide the safe space for those youth that are made to feel unwanted or unloved because of who they are. Uh, funding will assist these youth to gain access to vital clinical treatment in our mental health treatment program. Um, we are also asking for support for Homeless Students Initiative and through the Job, job Training and Placement Initiative. Um, this would expand funding in our CovWorks education and workforce programs, both of, both of which are offered to young people who stay with us and help them obtain high school diplomas, equivalency certificates, and employment as well. Um, the need for this is extreme. Uh, we, we have found that of the 1,600 young adults we served last year, nearly 60% of the youth 18 and older did not have a diploma or equivalency certificate, and a similar number entered our shelter last year with math skills at a sixth grade or lower level and reading skills at eighth grade or lower level. Um, so we know the need for this is great, and we ask for your continued support and expanded funding for those services. Um, and finally, we did want to talk about um, 
getting support for Metro cards as well. Um, in a study we've done with our legal department, we found last year that 55% of youth who stayed with us had been cited by the MTA or the MIPD for a violation of transit policy, um, meaning obviously fare evasion. Um, and we believe, and I'm sure that you do as well, that using our public transit system is a vi vital and fundamental need for all New Yorkers, especially our most vulnerable, um, and our young adults are no different. Um, and in order to facilitate positive outcomes among our young people, ensuring they can attend job interviews, medical appointments, housing searches, and much more, it is in our best interest and in New York City's to provide them the ability to get where they need to go. Um, I just wanted to highlight some of those initiatives that we are requesting funding for, and I want to thank the New York City Council for their consideration and support of Covenant House. Thank you so much. Okay, you guys got your own? I don't want to knock over the water. All right. <laughs> Good afternoon. My name is Jamie Polovich. I'm the Executive Director of the Coalition for Homeless Youth. Thank you to Chair Rose and the entire Youth Services Committee for allowing me to testify today. I also would just like to add how appreciative the coalition is for the ongoing support of the needs of runaway and homeless youth that you, Chair, have shown as well as Speaker Johnson. It's much appreciative. appreciated. Um, I won't read my full testimony. It gets a little lengthy, so I just want to highlight um, what we need your help with. So for the preliminary budget, um, the Coalition for Homeless Youth is requesting an additional $3.3 million in funding um, for the Department of Youth and Community Development Runaway and Homeless, in the Department of Youth and Community Development Runaway and Homeless Youth budget. Um, this increase would address two main gaps that we think are important and need to be filled. The first one would allow for funding for 40 additional runaway and homeless youth beds for older youth ages 21 to 24 years old. In fiscal year 19, through the council's advocacy as well as the support of the Unity Project, we were able to get 60 beds funded. They aren't yet up and available to young people, but we know that once they are, they are not gonna need, meet the need of the countless older youth that are seeking shelter services. So we are asking for an additional two million um, for 40 more beds. And then the second is for $1.3 million in funding for 20 runaway and homeless youth housing specialists. Unlike some of the other city agencies that support um, various populations with their residential needs, such as ACS and DHS, DYCD is one of the only systems that doesn't have specific positions funded to support people with housing placement, permanency, you know, whatever you want to call it, and it's very much needed. Caseworkers at a lot of our agencies are more than at capacity, meeting the needs of runaway and homeless youth, and filling out housing applications, looking for apartments, negotiating with landlords is just something that they don't always have the time to do, and it's also, quite frankly, a different skill set than many of them are trained in. And so the additional 1.3 million would fund 20 positions um, for housing specialists that would hopefully be housed at all of the runaway and homeless youth providers that serve the most youth in the city. Um, the last thing that I want to talk about is the mayor's management report. I know that council has heard me speak about this before, <laughs> um, so I won't bore you with all the, the details. They are in my report, um, but as DYCD testified to, they are making changes slowly but surely to it, the way that they're defining their outcomes as they relate to runaway and homeless youth, but we still think that there's a lot of work that needs to be done. Um, we think that if DYCD is continuing to leave their outcome regarding runaway and homeless youth as young people that are exiting crisis until programs to be reunited with family or in another suitable living environment, that the definition for that outcome can't be returning to their family or independent living and them still including discharge placements that are not either of those things. Um, I know that Ms. Haskell testified that they are no longer counting things like jail, but they are still counting things like transitioning homeless young people to adult homelessness. And we don't think um, that that is an accurate portrayal of what that definition is meant to represent. 
Um, and I go into more detail in my testimony about all the numbers um, and also some of our recommendations that take a little bit of a deeper dive into exactly how that could be reworded to better represent, um, one, the work that the providers are doing to meet the needs of the young people, and also to make sure that the public who reads the MMR gets a really transparent look at um, the data that DYCD is presenting. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for all the information you've given us so that we could fight back with them. Thank you. I'm always happy to provide information. <laughs> Good afternoon. My name is Vivian Santora, and I have the honor of serving as President and CEO of PowerPlay NYC. Um, I want to thank the Chairwoman um, and the committee for allowing us to testify today. Um, PowerPlay serves as the lead agency for the sports training and role models for success citywide girls initiative, acronym STARS CGI, uh, a collaboration of nine leading um, nonprofits helping girls and young women of color overcome barriers to success, gain access to high quality out of school activities and develop as leaders in their communities. The nine partners include PowerPlay, Girls Right Now, Groundswell, Lower East Side Girls Club, Row New York, which you'll be hearing from, Sadie Nash, you heard from earlier, um, the Armory Foundation, Figure Skating in Harlem, and Girls for Gender Equity. It has been said that the unfinished business of the 21st century is advancing the rights and opportunities of women and girls, full equality for women. But girls today face very real and very profound challenges. One in 10 girls is catcalled before her 11th birthday. Black girls in the US are suspended six times more likely than their white peers. Girls of color also face very specific factors that push them out of school entirely, like sexual assault, criminalization, and teacher stereotyping. Emotional health is at risk for our girls today. One in five teen girls report experiencing a mental disorder. More girls are living in poverty and low-income households today than 10 years ago. Obesity is also on the rise. But thankfully, statistics are not destiny. The City Council has often discussed the need for more programming for the city's most vulnerable youth population, and we could not agree more. New York City's young women represent a valuable source of talent and leadership. And in order to thrive, they need safe spaces to be active, think creatively, and talk about issues that impact them. And research reaffirms that girls, as you indicated earlier, once we know we invest in them, they reinvest in their communities and their families. So we're so grateful to the City Council that you acknowledge the importance and prioritize these opportunities. And um, fiscal 19 has been remarkable for our initiative. As of December 31st, um, the STARS partners had already served over 3,500 youth in all 51 city council districts um, through various programming, sports, academic en enrichment, um, STEM, college prep, and the arts. We hosted our second annual college fair back in October. We had nearly 300 girls attend and 40 colleges were represented. Uh, this April, STARS will be hosting our culminating event, our fifth annual Leadership Summit. We anticipate 600 participants. And um, today, the STARS partners respectfully request renewal um, and an enhancement totaling 1.65 um, 1.65 million, increasing um, 50,000 per organization. I'll end there. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, my name is Arshay Cooper. I'm oh, sorry. Um, do you have written testimony? We do. Yes. Okay. <laughs> we um, thank you. Thank Make you. Make sure that the Sergeant of Arms gets it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman, for having me. Uh, Marche Cooper from Row, New York. I'm the Chief uh, Community Engagement Officer, and um, I just want to thank all these lovely people for being here. And you know, I'm a product of after school program, and if it wasn't for after school, my mom would have had to quit one of her jobs. So I want to thank you guys for um, for being here and testifying about um, the power of um, nonprofit. Um, I'm from Row, New York, and it's um, uh, National Women History Month. So I'm going to talk about the young the young ladies uh, in our program at Row, New York. Um, we uh, have close to 300 young ladies that we serve every year at Row New York. 
Uh, we recruit them in schools. We teach them how to swim. Uh, we, uh, and they come in a row, and they're with us six days a week. And we have a 100% high school graduation rate, and 96% go to college. And the 4% that don't, it's military, gap year, or AmeriCorps. Um, and there's, you know, the Olympic uh, threat in the sport of rowing that if there's no diversity, um, there's a big chance that it won't be an Olympic sport, and it's the oldest Olympic sport. And so U.S. rowing came down on all these colleges saying, what do we do about this? And that's where we come in at. We recruit kids from um, Canarsie, uh, under, uh, every under-resourced community in New York, and we give them a shot of rowing. And uh, we work so hard to make sure that um, they go to college, they have academic support, we do panels, we work closely with STARS. STARS has been so supportive uh, in our work and what we do. Well, one of the things we started this year was an uh, entrepreneurship program where we teach our young people about entrepreneurship. They take classes every week um, and then uh, work with the communities. And the goal is that they come back to their community and work in the same school, which ties into our alumni core program. Every young person that graduated from our Rowe New York program with the college come back. We give them their first job and put them back in the community that they grew up in. And, um, and we believe that's Dr. King's vision of a beloved community. And um, we are just so excited about the sport of rowing and what's coming next and what we do with our young girls. And uh, we also work 100 and 120 girls a year with physical disabilities, teaching them how to row, putting them on the water, giving them the experience uh, of this great sport that changed my life many, many years ago. Um, so um, that's my time, but I want to uh, thank you guys, and um, I, I appreciate all the love and support again from everyone. And, um, you know, if you ever want to get on the water, come row with us and come row with our girls. We'd love to have you. So I appreciate it. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you for testifying. I'm going to take you up on that. I'm going to. All right, I give you my card. I want you to come roll with the girls. They'll love it. I need the cardio. <laughs> um, uh, do you have your testimony? You know what? It's, uh, it's, it was emailed. It's yeah, yeah. It's okay. going to be emailed. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you all. I, I want to say this about all of the, um, the people who testified today. Thank you for the comprehensive, you know, reports and, and testimony. It gives us a lot to... Um, to work with and, and to sort of, it gives us some meat to, to have when the administration gives us the glossy version. We have the real gritty one. So I wanna thank you. Um, and our next panel will be, thank you all. Emmy Lamb, Chinese American Planning Council. Tasfia Rahman. Coalition for Asian American Children and Families. Amy Williamson, Sheltering Arms, Children and Family Services. Faith Beam, UJA Federation. David Calvert, Youth Build NYC Collaborative. And Dee Mandivan and Shane Corella, Center for Court Innovation and Youth Justice Board. Um, hi. Um, as soon as you uh, get your seat, identify yourself, tell us your organization so we can get started. Okay, please identify yourself, give us your name, organization, and you may begin. Good afternoon. My name is Amy Wilkerson. I'm the Director of Youth Services at Sheltering Arms Children and Family Services. I want to thank you, Chair Rose, and members of the Youth Services Committee for the opportunity to speak before you today. <clears throat> 
Sheltering Arms is one of the largest providers of education, youth development, and community and family well-being programs in Bronx, Manhattan, Brooklyn, and Queens. We serve more than 15,000 low-income children, youth, and families each year through more than 50 programs. We are one of the providers citywide that provide a full continuum of care for youth experiencing homelessness and serve more than 3,000 homeless and at-risk youth each year through two drop-in centers, one crisis shelter, two transitional independent living residents, and soon a HUD-funded rapid rehousing program, which we were awarded this year. We have provided services for youth who are homeless or at risk of homelessness for more than 20 years. As a member of the New York City Association of Homeless and Street-Involved Youth Organizations, we echo the request for an investment of $3.3 million in the FY20 budget to support DYCD programming for runaway and homeless youth. This increase reflects needed investments of $2 million for 40 additional beds for homeless youth aged 21 to 24 and $1.3 million for 20 housing specialists to focus on permanency planning with youth. As New York City faces budget cuts for FY20, these investments are crucial to supporting the long-term stability of youth and to follow through on DYCD's commitment to helping youth get off the streets and stabilize their lives. The inclusion of the 21 to 24 year old beds, um, 24 to 20 year olds in RHY services was a huge step forward and we appreciate the 60 beds that were added to the system in FY19. However, 60 beds citywide is just not enough. On any given night, Sheltering Arms has 10 to 15 youth in this age range who stay overnight in our Jamaica drop-in center because they are afraid of entering the adult homeless system. This does not count our drop-in center in Far Rockaway, which just opened in January, or the other drop-in center providers across the city. We are glad that regulations now reflect the need for 21 to 24 year olds to be included in RHY system rather than the adult system. But that change means little if we don't have the capacity to serve this particular vulnerable population. Youth who are between the ages of 21 to 24 often have aged out of every other support system and with only 60 beds, many are still being left to fend for themselves. I have more, what if you could read? Thank you so much for allowing me to speak. I wanna thank you. Um, what would you say would be um, an adequate number of beds based on the need you see? I, I think that the amount of beds needed is very close to the amount needed for the youth younger than that age range. Mm -hmm. um, 40 is, uh, 60 is very little. Mm -hmm. I think 120 would be a much better starting place. And then we can see from there um, if we need more. But it, the most youth that we serve in our 24 hour drop in are 21 to 24 year olds who are afraid to enter into the um, DHS system. Um, and then we have a lot of young people that age out of our um, tills and crisis shelters um, and are in the same situation where they don't wanna go into uh, adult homeless system. And we don't have um, the proper uh, avenues for them once they age out to be in supportive housing, permanent housing. We don't have enough permanent housing resources. So those young people end up cycling back into the system, utilizing 24 hour drop-ins. So there should be um, a continuity to the pipeline. Yes. When they age out of the till um, or the crisis beds, there should be a continuum of services. They shouldn't have to leave. Right. And, okay. Right. In, in that there's a large percentage of young people. I mean, if we could just think about ourselves as adults, how hard it is to afford rent in New York City. Uh, how do we expect young people, some of them have never had jobs before, many of the young people, about 70% that come into our programs have not completed high school, to be able to uh, get jobs that can earn enough income to be able to completely support themselves on their own. Some of them have never had their own um, jobs in the past, they have no work history, and they have to rely on other DYCD funded programs to get like, you know, uh, 
SYEP and programs like that to build their resume. How can you spend two, two years in a system and expect that at the end of the two years you're able to fend for yourself? We just need more beds for that age range so that way those young people can have a continuum of care or if, the, if their point of entry into the system is at 21 or 22 years old, that we have the capacity for those individuals as well. And the adults um, and the adult homeless services are just not supportive enough for that age group, or it's just too scary. Or I, I think that uh, the, the biggest problem is the the intake process is what they're really afraid of, because in order to intake into the system, you have to go through um, one of the armories. And um, that can be a really scary experience for someone who's 21 or 22 years old, where you have um, many adults that are recently released from incarceration. You have those uh, substance using, um, those with uh, persistent mental health issues. Um, and a lot of them are victimized in situations like that. They just can't navigate that system. So, you know, a few of them try and, you know, one or two bad experiences and then, um, you know, they won't try again. They would rather do anything else besides go through that system again, even if it means having to survive uh, by sleeping on people's sofas or even engaging in survival sex and survival crimes. So, um, it's just important that we're able to not neglect the 21 to 24 year olds because they're still very vulnerable. And we know that um, most adolescents are not fully developed until the age of 25 or 26 anyway. So we want to just be able to continue to support them because uh, they need it. Thank you. Thank you. David? Hi, I'm David Calvert from Youth Build, um, representing the collaborative. Uh, the Youth Build NYC Collaborative. It's a delight to be here, and Chairman Debbie, you are so aware of Youth Build already, I'm not gonna go into details about the program, but I will say that um, since the city started supporting Youth Build, of course we're 40 years old as a program, it's a New York City program that has spread around the world. Now we're in 23 countries, and we're in 260 Youth Builds across the United States, but it's really a New York City program that is now uh, in nine renditions here in, in the five boroughs. And uh, in the last five years, the council has been a really strong supporter of Youth Build, spreading it um, to more programs. And um, you know, nine programs, including all five boroughs, is not what we used to have. And we really appreciate the support of the council for that. The reason I'm here today is, well, it's to say thank you and to be appreciative, not just of Youth Build and the Council, but really everyone who's been here today, because it's just such an awesome feeling of, of love I get to hear how much great stuff is going on in the city. And, um, you know, everybody should do this kind of thing as part of their school education, I think, come into these kinds of hearings and just hear all the great work going on in our city. But my reason to be here today is to, um, to, to express the urgency we have um, at the Youth Build movement because we did get two new federal grants and we usually rely on the federal grants to supplement the city funds and make sure we're, we're having all our programs be funded. But this year, the federal grants came in only to support two new programs. So the existing youth build programs are left kind of in trouble. And um, so we're asking for an increase this year. Um, typically, it's been $2.1 million for youth build citywide and we're asking for 3.4 million. And we will submit a full uh, proposal um, laying out the basis for those numbers to the council. Um, but we are asking for this increase to make sure that services are kept at the optimum level and that you know there's always follow-up services for young people who've been through the program in the past, that we don't just flat drop them when they leave. Um, one of the youth build uh, principles is once a youth build, always a youth build, and you get that support for the rest of your life. So, um, you know, I've just, the important thing is that the programs not be left uh, scantily funded, but really supported to be able to do that maximum job. Uh, uh, as you know, youth build students are getting their GEDs in the program, they're getting their leadership development, they're getting their, their counseling, they're getting job placements, they're getting vocational training, they're building housing for the community. Um, that comprehensive approach um, needs to be embraced and pushed forward. Yeah. Thank you, Debbie.
And, and how much um, was the, I guess, the amount that you didn't get from the fed federal government? You the federal government uh, supported two new programs, but did not fund any of the existing programs this year. So previously, you got how much um, federal money? Typically, we get about $3.3 million a year coming in from the feds. And, and the city typically gives $2.1 million, and then every program pulls in other resources. And, um, and this year, the feds only gave you what? $2.2 million. Okay. But those, those uh, two grants went to programs that were not two operative. programs, right. So, yeah. Okay. Thank so you. It's, so it's a bit of an emergency, but, you know, we're, we're plugging along like always. Thank you, David. Thanks. Next. Hi, um, um, my name is Tasfia Rahman, and I'm a policy coordinator at the Coalition for Asian American Children and Families, CACF. Um, I would just like to thank um, the council member chair for chairing the youth committee and for holding this oversight hearing. Um, since 1986, CACF is the nation's only pan-Asian children and families advocacy organization and leads the fight for improved and equitable policy systems, funding, and services to support those in need. The APA population comprises over 15% of New York City, over 1.3 million people. Yet the needs of the APA community are consistently overlooked, misunderstood, and uncounted. We are constantly fighting the harmful impacts of the model minority myth, which prevents our needs from being recognized and understood. We also lead the 15% and growing campaign, a group of over 45 Asian-led and serving organizations that work together to ensure that New York City's budget protects the most vulnerable APAs. Campaign members um, employ thousands of New Yorkers and serve hundreds of thousands of um, New, York, uh, New York City APA families and children and also outside the community as well. We are particularly concerned about any gap in investment in youth services, especially services that help immigrant youth. Youth services are critical to immigrant youth who struggle with English language proficiency, the acculturation process, and inadequate academic preparation. Immigrant youth come from families that face high rates of poverty, live in linguistic isolation, and lack, lack the knowledge of available systems and resources. Despite the model minority stereotype, APA youth must also overcome the following challenges. In the New York State Department of Education schools, one of every five APA students do not graduate from high school in time or at all. Nearly two-thirds of APA students in New York City come from homes where languages other than English is spoken. One in four ELL learner students are APA. Um, we also have the highest linguistic isolation um, at 42%. APAs also have the highest um, poverty rate across all ethnic racial groups in New York City. So without youth services, many immigrant youth can find themselves isolated and marginalized. And without the support to navigate systems and access to critical services that will put them on the path to become competent and responsible adults. So two um, recommendations that I'd like to highlight um, are restoring funds for um, the summer, uh, the summer component for Sonic, and um, also the um, eight million for Compass Elementary School after school programs. While we appreciate the expansion of um, uh, elementary uh, sites for Compass programs, we still hear from providers that um, it's not accessible to APA com um, uh, families uh, in particular neighborhoods and parts of boroughs that have highly um, immigrant populations, such as southeastern Queens, southern Bronx, parts of Eastern parts of Brooklyn, um, so we 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 can uh, we want to urge City Council to continue pushing for investment in those programs. Um, thank you, uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity to testify, and we look forward to working with City Council to ensure that all New York young people have access to service and support they need. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, hi. Good afternoon. My name is Emmy Lam. And I'm a program assistant and a worksite liaison for the Education and Career Services Division of the Chinese American Planning Council. Uh, thank you, Chair Rose, and the member of the Youth Services Committee for this opportunity to testify. Um, founded in 1965, CPC is a social services organization to create positive social change. Uh, we empower Asian Americans, uh, immigrants, low-income communities in the New York City by ensuring that they have access to resource and opportunities needed to thrive. Um, we are actually a trusted partner for more than 60,000 individuals 
and families striving to achieve goals through their education, family, community, and career. Um, we are located at uh, 33 sites all over Manhattan, Brooklyn, and Queens. Um, as a community provider of the Summer Youth Employment Program and the Work, Learn, and Grow Program, we appreciate that the City Council have on the New York City's uh, young youth employment and the positive impact to both the program and the New York uh, City's youth people. Um, however, we are deeply concerned that this uh, fiscal year of 2020 preliminary budget does not include the Work, Learn, and Grow program. Um, the program that's previously funded as 19 million for the city's uh, physical 2019 adopted budget. Um, due to my personal experience that I've seen firsthand that the WLG bridges the success of SYP. And the WLG program basically gives an um, opportunity for young participants to better understand their balance of academics and employment responsibilities while cultivating self-empowerment and continuing to develop strong and supportive foundations for their future. Um, a few examples of our partners that we collaborate includes accounting firms, hospitals, real estate agencies, retails, and education uh, centers. Uh, the diversity of these industries not only ensures that our youth has different opportunity to explore and, and to allow them to build healthy, long-term professional relationship with their members, mentors uh, throughout, the school, the, throughout the school year while further developing their skills. Um, this recent uh, WLG program that recently ended, we had records of over 70% of our youth that worked over at least 90% of their maximum uh, 250 hours allocated to each participant in the WLG throughout the year. And additionally, over 20% of our youth were given part-time offers after the deployment, after the WLG program completion. So our data basically clearly shows that the youth hold, withhold themselves accountable to, and are committed to this program and that the work sites are equally as committed to investing um, each year's youth success. Um, I have an example of where we had a feedback of one of our work site supervisors that of a large retail basically uh, finds this as a very appreciative and that this allows them to actually kind of screen these potential participants and um, they go as above to where they have past colleagues that actually came through these programs from SYP and WLG program, where they even got promoted into becoming a store manager because of this. Thank you. So I firmly believe that this is a vital program for the New York City youth and young adults as a work-based um, learning experience that allows them to explore their careers and options in an intentional way of acting a critical source of income for themselves and their families, allowing them to um, begin establishing and growing their professional network. Okay. So again, therefore, we urge that you restore the 90 million to the Work, Learn, and Grow program and strongly consider expanding the program to serve more New York uh, youth. Okay. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to testify. Thank you so much. Um, I don't believe we had your testimony. Uh, oh, right. <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Yes, next. <laughs> Good afternoon, Chair Rose and esteemed members of the City Council. My name is Dean Mandian, pronouns they and them, uh, and I'm the Program Manager of the Center for Court Innovation's Youth Justice Board. I'm here with Shane Karaya, pronouns he, him, who is the Associate Director of Strategic Partnerships at the Center, and we thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I'm here to request that the Council support the Center for Court Innovation as it seeks to renew and strengthen the work that we do with over 75,000 New Yorkers annually, many of whom are children and young people. Researchers have documented that our operating programs throughout the city have decreased violence, aided victims, reduced the use of jail, and transformed neighborhoods through such projects as the Staten Island Justice Center. To continue to accomplish this work, we seek continuation funding for our core citywide speaker request, our youth-focused supervised release programming operating out of Brooklyn Justice Initiatives, and our Bronx pre-arraignment diversion programming known as Project Reset. We also request Council to expand funding available under the Mental Health Initiatives for Vulnerable Populations and for Court-Involved Youth. We have submitted several applications to permit us to increase mental health access in the outer boroughs where demand outstrips our current capacity. For example, our Strong Starts Initiative, operating in Staten Island, Queens, and the Bronx, has resolved neglect cases in as few as six months compared to 17 on average in the traditional system. That's the difference between a child returning to their family from ACS custody as an infant instead of as a toddler. But currently, as I said, demand outstrips capacity. 
We only have four strong starts caseworkers citywide, and there are over 3,000 qualified neglect positions filed annually. Through council support, we could provide enhanced mental health services and community supervision to diverted youth and their families. A summary of our applications has been submitted with our testimony. <clears throat> uh, for the record, my name is Shane Karaya, uh, the Associate Director of Strategic Partnerships. Uh, 16 years ago, I was actually also a youth in the program that DE currently manages at the Center for Court Innovation. I was a high-risk truant with family that was convicted for violent offenses um, and at one point homeless. During that time, the Center for Court Innovation and their program staff continued to provide services as well as emotional support. Uh, with that said, in addition to believing strongly in the work that the center does from my own personal experience, they have a research arm that demonstrates the impact that they have for cases such as myself, for the over 75,000 New Yorkers that they do serve. Accordingly, we'd like to request that those applications uh, be further invested in, uh, specifically the Schedule C initiatives for vulnerable populations in court-involved youth. Thank you for this opportunity to speak. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Chairperson Rose. My name is Faith Bayham. I am an advocacy and policy advisor at UJA Federation of New York. On behalf of UJA, our network of nonprofit partners and those we serve, thank you for this opportunity to testify on the importance of maintaining and expanding services for the youth of New York City. UJA's network of nonprofit partners oversee a number of DYCD funded youth focused programs, including, but not exclusive to, summer youth employment programs, work, learn, and grow. Compass and Sonic programs. UJA is also an active member of the Campaign for Children. We recognize the support the City Council has provided to all the DYCD programs in the past and hope to maintain this moving forward. Uh, we have a number of recommendations for the fiscal 2020 budget, including that 20.35 million be included in the executive budget for Sonic summer programs for middle school students. Uh, we're asking that we baseline 8 million to maintain current capacity in the Compass Elementary After School program, um, ensuring that all after school Compass programs are funded at the same rate. And then we're asking to restore and baseline 19 million for the Work, Learn, and Grow program. Uh, we also want to share a number of our concerns with the recent SYEP awards. Um, once providers received their SYEP awards at the end of February 2019, they still had to grapple with the inadequate rate per, per, per participant to cover the true cost of maintaining high quality programs. Since 2008, providers have been compensated for younger youth and older youth programs at a rate of 325 per, partic per participant. In 2019, providers were awarded community-based younger youth slots, were received 600 per, per participant, while community-based older youth providers will receive 450 per slot. While the price per participant were increased in the final 2019 SYP awards, the increases are not enough to continue to provide high quality programs while meeting new requirements and staffing ratios. Uh, older youth community-based program staffing requirements include maintaining a full-time program director for 12 months, a full-time job developer for six months, and a full-time education coordinator for six months. Providers were also encouraged to include a full-time or part-time counselor or social worker for a minimum of six months. Programs also need to offer competitive salaries for all these positions in order to attract high-quality candidates. One of the ways programs could meet the staffing requirements is by serving a larger number of older youth. In their proposals, programs requested to serve larger numbers of older youth in order to make their budgets work. Unfortunately, many awardees were promised significantly less older youth slots in many cases, hundreds less than they proposed. Some were even awarded less slots than they were awarded in the last RFP. These providers are aiming for additional slots to make their budgets work with the hope of being notified before June in order to be prepared to serve additional youth in July. Um, so mainly, providers are open with the OICD about their concerns. I have more information in my testimony. Uh -huh. um, the bottom line is, is that we're urging administration to increase the community-based younger youth and older youth per participant rates. Um, so this additional funding will be used by providers to meet the increased staffing demands of the new program models. Um, thank you for your time, and once again, thank you for your support of all these programs. Thank you so much. Um, uh, from the Center for Court Innovation, many of your requests seem to be borough-based. Um, 
Are the, is there a request that is citywide? Uh, so um, we've submitted several applications since we have over 22 programs that operate throughout the five boroughs. Uh, for citywide center for court innovation uh, applications, um, there's a list of those in the back of our attachment. It includes the core ask of $500,000 that goes to programming throughout all five boroughs, mm -hmm. um, as well as some through the specific initiatives that we listed, such as Strong Starts, which currently operates in three of the outer boroughs. Okay, thank you. I want again thank you all for your comprehensive statements um, and for your time here today. Thank you. And I think this is our last panel. No, two more. No, two, more. two more. Two more panels. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Wow. I thank you. Really, really thank you for your patience. <laughs> and you've been sitting in those terrible chairs all this time. Okay. Okay. Next panel: Peter G. The door. Harriet Lassell, JCCA, yes, City's sorry. First Readers, CFR, Emily Rowland, Kane, United Way, NYC, plus City's First Readers, Ileana Godoy, Link, and CFR, and Leslie Brown, Reach Out and Read, and City's First Read. As soon as you get there, whoever gets there, uh, say your name, your organization, and jump right in, okay? Thank you, Chair Rose. My name is Peter G. I'm Chief of Staff at The Door. Um, oh, okay. Oh. Um, so for over 45 years, the door has served as an invaluable resource for New York City youth, including those facing homelessness, unemployment, poverty, and deportation. The door's mission remains to empower young people to reach their full potential um, by providing comprehensive youth services in a diverse and caring environment. Um, each year, we work with 11,000 young people ages 12 to 24, many of whom have one or more barriers impacting the, their ability to thrive. So our services are all free of charge to young people, including primary and behavioral health, education, and career, um, creative arts, food and nutrition, legal and immigration, and supportive housing. Um, we just want to echo some of the comments made by um, our the Coalition for Homeless Youth. Um, um, we are one of the largest drop-in centers in New York City and echo all of the additional resources for um, for uh, RHY DYCD programming. Um, I'm specifically um, here today to talk a little bit about the redesign of the city's young adult internship program. And the Young Adult Literacy Program reflected in the December release of the city's advanced and earned content paper. There are more than 136,000 opportunity youth between the ages of 18 to 24 in New York City, uh, according to a recent report um, by um, Community Services Society. Community Service Society's report highlighted that although the population has shrunk, the great they face a greater challenge um, to reconnection because the easiest to serve youth have already been connected to school or work. Um, the remaining pool um, need additional support. Um, the city's RFP does not take this, is, this into account because it serves um, less youth with fewer resources. Um, so just to give you context, the last time um, they uh, did the RFP, um, the Young Adult Internship Program and the Young Adult Literacy Program um, served 20, uh, 2,435 young people with nearly 16 million in funding. And the Advance and Earn um, program that the city released, um, the concept paper for, will serve only 800 young people citywide with less than half of the previous budget, um, 7.2 million. Um, so we, along with some of the other out-of-school youth um, workforce providers, have a lot of concerns with this, not only because the RFP is going to be released in April, which leaves a little time for us um, to put, a get, put together a program, a completely new program by July 1st, um, but uh, in general, high school um, equivalency participants 
may not want to earn a credential if they want to pursue college or enter the workforce immediately. Uh, the cost per participant is not sufficient to provide instructional supports for low literacy participants, many whom have an IEP. Um, there are many opportunity youth that test below the fourth grade literacy level, um, and stipends in our experience have been more effective than paid internships for youth that are in pre-high school equivalency services. Um, the recruitment cycles are just really challenging, and then uh, the program design doesn't really cover the needs of um, young, ad uh, young adults uh, uh, that are parents and young people that are involved with foster care and juvenile justice systems. Um, so we don't have our testimony uh, um, fully like uh, copies for you because we're working with some of the out of school youth providers uh, to put together like a letter highlighting some of our shared, uh, some of these shared con concerns around the advanced center and concept paper um, that we hopefully will get to you later this week. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Could, um, you have to um, put oh. your mic on. I'm the project manager for City's First Readers, a New York City early uh, childhood initiative, and it's called City's First Readers. Um, City Source Readers is a collaboration between 11 nonprofit organizations that foster literacy development in New York City for children from birth through five. The expertise of each is multiplied by our work together. Reading to infants and toddlers, naming objects that they see and touch, and talking directly to them contribute to the development of their growing brains, and it gives them the essential start being ready for school and ready to read. Did you know that families where parents identify as professional, those children enter school having experience being read to 1,000 to 1,700 hours on average, compared to children living in poverty less than 25. Mm -hmm. City's First Readers, for, um, I'm sorry, City's First Readers is attacking this issue collaboratively with our partners. Right now, nearly two out of three New York City children living in poverty are not reading on grade level when they're tested in the third grade. A student living in poverty who can't read at grade level by third grade is 13 times less likely to graduate from high school on time and, more, and to become a proficient reader. In 2015, over half of the poor black and Hispanic youth and new children in New York City lived in high or extreme poverty neighborhoods. Schools alone can't do this by themselves, and the solution is a key of, is provision, I'm sorry, is prevention, working collaboratively with these partners. In 2014, New York City Council took the decisive action to address the literacy crisis facing New York City by investing in the City's First Readers initiative. With the Council's leadership, City's First Readers expanded its it's effective community-based programs to help parents and young children in New York City be prepared to read and succeed in school. City's First Readers is making this a reality. In, 20, in the FY18 program year, the initiative served approximately 700,000 children and families throughout all five boroughs and in all 51 council districts. We need your renewed support, and we respectfully re are requesting a budget enhancement of $6 million. We are currently funded at $4.44 million among the 11 partners. The renewed support will support increased direct services to reach more families. It will strengthen outreach to connect families and caregivers directly to programs and services. It will provide families and caregivers with developmentally appropriate books. It will strengthen the collaboration and the infrastructure of this initiative and our evaluation capacity. And it will also expand our initiative public awareness messaging, Read the City. Science is clear. And ro a robust investment in early childhood programming can break the cycles of poverty. And we ask that you continue to support the initiative. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Harriet LaSalle. I am the Director of Government Contracts and Advocacy at JCCA. I want to thank uh, Chairperson Rose and staff for 
um, the opportunity to testify today. JCC is very appreciative of the council's interest in early literacy and funding of the city's first readers, and we are here today in support of the request for $6 million in funding for uh, 2020. I'm not gonna read my um, testimony, I'll just uh, give some highlights. Um, one of the most, one of the distinctive things about this is the partnership. So all of the partners are asking for the entire request, not just for our own programs. Um, we have had Literacy Inc. come and read to our children. We have had folks from the Bronx Library come and read to our children and give out um, library cards so that uh, parents and children can continue this work. Um, when they get home. We have participated in a resource fair in Woodhull Hospital giving out books to uh, children who are visiting at the pediatric clinic along with other partners. Um, and having this partnership really helps us look, about, look at how we can increase early literacy throughout our programming. So we have two transfer high schools for overage undercredited youth. There's a lot of young parents there. Um, and being able to focus on early literacy and thinking about how we can expand is something that's, go that's complete, that is a, a, a very high value as has been recognized, I think, by the council. Um, JCC is very fortunate to be in our second year of funding this year. We're the only child welfare agency to participate in the initiative, serving the youngest children in foster care in our Brooklyn and Bronx offices. Um, foster youth are at an even greater advantage because they experience trauma, frequently changed homes, and changed schools and childcare. Um, and through City's First Readers, we have been able to create literacy-rich spaces in our, um, in our offices and have a special place for families to come. Um, we have, uh, children have access to books and we've distributed over 860 books just this year to 120 families. Reading is, is modeled um, and the youngest children um, can build, start the building blocks that they need um, to become lifelong learners. Um, in one of our groups, there was a young woman, a 17-year-old parent of a two, almost three-year-old, felt, uh, was having problems relating, um, you know, to her at home, said that she watched too much TV, that she was hyperactive. By participating in our group, was really able to understand the value of literacy, and when this child went for her 3K, um, 3K uh, admission hearing, um, she was found to have a much higher literacy rate than a lot of the other children as a result of this uh, young mom coming to Thank the you. groups. So uh, I want to, again, encourage our ask for $6 million. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Um, my name Bless is you. Emily Roland Kane. Bless you. <laughs> I'm the manager of community building for United Way of New York City, and we thank the council for your continued support and investment in City's First Readers and urge the administration to support an increase in the fiscal year 20 initiative funding to expand the impact of this critical investment in early childhood literacy. Um, at United Way, we have a Read NYC program, and it's a dual generation initiative designed to provide coordinated interventions and needed resources for children, families, schools, and community partners. Our aim is to improve grade level reading by third grade for children in some of the most challenged communities in New York City. Um, since 2016, we've collaborated with City's First Readers to strengthen our work in Mott Haven. As you know, Mott Haven is one of the poorest congressional districts in the United States. Um, and when we started Read NYC in Mott Haven five years ago, less than one in 10 children were reading on grade level. And last year, 43% of third graders at our Read NYC schools are reading proficiently by third grade. Um, in the past year, with the collaboration and support of City's First Readers, We've been able to distribute books through our partnership with Imagination Library, which delivers free books for children below the age of five to build at-home libraries. Um, we've partnered at the events that Harriet mentioned as well with the Woodhull Hospital, um, the Brooklyn Public Library event, and our, we host events with Link at the Mott Haven Public Library and do read-alouds and sing-alongs. Um, we've increased reading opportunities by supporting access to digital reading programs. We've provided parents access to resources in our parent engagement and empowerment work. 
um, and professional development through instructional leadership to principals and teachers in Mott Haven and the Brownsville. Um, and with enhanced funding, we would hope to expand the Imagination Library program beyond Mott Haven to serve the wider Bronx. Um, with more funding, we could expand our reach to over 8,000 children in a ramp up period of 16 months. Um, we would magnify our parent engagement work to further engage parents in creating more language and literacy rich home life for children um, and build out Read MIC. So we would build on lessons learned from the Read MIC initiative in Mott Haven and develop an expanded network of success in other neighborhoods, starting with an expansion to the Greater Bronx. So in conclusion, we urge um, further investment in the city's first readers initiative so organizations like United Way can continue prov to provide the resources and services to ensure our children enter school, school ready um, to read and achieve ed educational success. Thank you again for your continued partnership. Thank you. Hello committee and Madam Chair, my name is Leslie Brown. I am the interim executive director for Reach Out and Read of Greater New York. I want to take the opportunity to thank the City Council for their commitment to ensure that New York children who participate in our program will begin school with the literacy skills that will enable them to succeed. I'm also representing City's First Readers, where we are asking for $6 million. More than half, and I have heard um, everyone say this, but I need to say it again, more than half of New York City public school third graders read below grade level. The problem is even bigger in low-income communities where one age-appropriate book exists for every 300 children. Oftentimes, caregivers in these communities lack resources to read to their children on a regular basis. Without a consistent reading ritual, young children will enter kindergarten at a tremendous disadvantage and spend elementary school catching up. Children who do not read proficiently by third grade are four times more likely to drop out of school. As a national program, our mission is to make literacy promotion an integral component of pediatric primary care, which makes us unique. No one else is doing this. In hospitals and clinics at each well-child pediatric visit, from six months to five years of age, families are provided with a free children's book. Pediatricians and other medical staff members provide guidance and support to parents to promote reading and other literacy activities at each of these well visit, child visits. Volunteers read aloud to children in the waiting room, modeling book sharing behavior for parents and providing literacy experiences for children. And I will say that um, when I came on as interim executive director, I had an opportunity to go out to our sites and to witness our program, which was absolutely incredible to see, even with technology, the gleeful smiles and excitement in a children's, in, in a child's eye when they receive a book. It's amazing to see. We also have our program in the Floating Hospital, and if you know the Floating Hospital, it sees on average 700 to 1,000 homeless children every six months. And um, I had an opportunity to witness our program in action, and we had um, um, something that truly warmed my heart was I was there talking with our volunteers, and a little one came in, um, knocked on the door, and uh, he asked for a book. Um, so he knew where to go, and we gave him a book, and um, he left happy, and then a minute later, he came back with another homeless child uh, to get a book. So we know our program is working. Since 1989, clinical studies have demonstrated the positive impact and effect we have on the home literacy environment due to increases in book sharing, other language and literacy-rich activities. Positive attitudes about reading among parents has also increased. And just to, um, in the interest of time, to let you know, we have currently 233 sites in the greater and upstate New York areas. And of the 233 sites, 170 are in all five boroughs. In 2018, we served 207,000 New York City children and distributed 355,000 books. OK, can Our you wrap up? I'm sorry? Can you wrap up? Yes, I will wrap up really quickly. All I need to say is that at this point, 50% um, um, of, our, of our, our sites, only 50% um, are getting books, meaning that they are getting only 50%, and we want to make sure that they get 100%. But that's based on funding that we need. So okay. with that said, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Okay, thank you.
I have to say I love to read. I have participated in all of the literacy programs. I read to the school the kids all the time in the hospital and the schools. Great. I, I love literacy programs. Uh, thank you for what you're doing because I really do believe it's the passport out of poverty. Yes. So thank you. Thank you. And this is the last panel and I'm thank you so much for your patience. Ingrid Bintel, City's First Readers. Kathleen Ilaqua, Jumpstart City's First Readers. Ooh, Jennifer okay. Schmidt, CHCF, CFR. Jillian Miller, Queens Public, uh, Brooklyn Public, NYPL, CFR. Brian Roby, VIP and CFR. Andre Eaton, CFR. Please identify yourself, your group, and, and start. Good evening. My name is Jennifer Schmidt, and I'm the director of the Early Care and Education Institute. Uh, put your, please put the microphone on. Oh, sorry. Okay. Uh, good evening. My name is Jennifer Schmidt, and I'm the director of the Early Care and Education Institute at the Committee for Hispanic Children and Families, um, known by its acronym CHCF. Um, CHCF is a nonprofit organization with a 35-year history of combining education, capacity building, and advocacy to strengthen the support system and continuum of learning for children and youth. I will be speaking to two key pieces of CHCF's work in strengthening the support system and continuum of learning for New York City's children and youth, early care literacy programming, and K-12 after school programming. As part of CHCF's commitment to strengthening the continuum of learning and birth through school age, our programming and supports begin in the early education sector. CHCF works directly with registered and licensed home-based child care providers who are primarily Spanish-speaking to enhance the quality of literacy programming to our youngest learners. CHCF has been part of the City's First Readers Initiative for the past four years. We have discovered that many child care provider programs often do not have age-appropriate books, books in quality condition, or books in the first language of the child care educator or children in care. We use our CFR funding to purchase a variety of English, Spanish, and bilingual children's books and develop accompanying materials for our coaching model. CHCF coaches model a read aloud and facilitate activities for the child care educator and children in care. Activities can include art, music and movement, and dramatic play. The book and accompanying materials are then left in the program with the child care provider for future use. After each session, children in the program also get to take home an age-appropriate book in their first language. Um, upon completion, programs receive a personalized literacy kit, which includes books, literacy-related games, and various educational materials. Um, in FY18, CHCF was able to serve 175 child care programs, distributing over 1,500 books and um, 322 literacy kits to families. As part of our um, first portion of FY19, we've served 312 children in 28 different child care programs, distributing over 1,000 books. And we join our City's First Readers partners in calling for an increase in funding um, to $6 million, um, which would allow us to continue to further expand and enhance our reach in this work. Um, and then just very briefly speaking to our after-school program request, um, CHCF has been providing after-school services in the Bronx for over 20 years. Um, we currently have two programs funded primarily through the state, um, serving 350 elementary school students. And through this funding, we are able to bring much needed child care for working families, engage students in high quality extended learning time programming, and provide a positive environment that mentors and supports our youth for three additional hours every day after school. Um, we know that the funding that um, these programs are severely underfunded throughout the state. Um, and given the tremendous impact that having access to high quality out of school time programming has for students and families, we urge the city to develop a plan for universal access um, to those after school programs. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Literacy Inc. appreciates the opportunity to testify about the important work we are doing as part of the New York City Council's early literacy initiative, City First Readers. Link programs around children from the earliest days with increased opportunities to read and be read to. Our model includes both direct services to children and equally important services for adults in their life so that parents and caregivers can support their children in all the important pre-reading experiences that lead to a love of reading and literacy. My name is Eliana Godoy. 
I'm the Director of Strategic Initiatives at LINK. I can speak to the effectiveness of LINK's programs as a parent of a daughter in the public school system, as an immigrant, in a previous ELL student myself, and as someone who finds real joy in empowering parents to support their children. LINK understands that a community's great, greatest resource is its people, and the parents all want uh, for their children to succeed. We provide the strategies and the age-appropriate books that help parents make reading with their children part of their daily routine, whether or not they speak English, whether or not they're uh, literate. Uh, we serve about um, 15,000 families. We distribute about 12,000 books. And from the parents that we serve, 95% understand the importance of reading with their child. 85% read more often with their children. 89% have more books at home. 90% of the parents with children five years and younger reported that Link taught them the importance of reading to their child from birth. I'm gonna go a little bit of script here to say to you that 80% of our early childhood uh, programs are run by women who were participants themselves in, in our programs. So we train families, particularly mothers, and lately we have had a lot of fathers, to become their child's first, first teacher and main advocate. And uh, the proof is in the staff who have co received complete transformation, they themselves are able to support their own community. So we're really building a sustainable culture of literacy at the neighborhood level by empowering parents to believe, to know that they can in fact be leaders in their own communities. And the 80% of our early childhood programming being run by women who were previous participants of our programs are a testament of the transformation that literacy has. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have your testimony? Yeah. Uh, okay. Please give it to the... Hi, my name is Katie Alacqua and I am the Director of Community Impact for Jumpstart. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on behalf of City's First Readers and an increase in funding to six million. Jumpstart is a national service nonprofit celebrating its 25th year. Over the course of its 25 years, Jumpstart has trained more than 45,000 college students and community volunteers, preparing nearly 100,000 children for kindergarten success. We leverage partnerships with higher education institutions, community organizations, Head Start programs, community-based preschools, and school districts to create sustainable solutions in order to close the kindergarten readiness gap. For a little more than 20 of those years, we have proudly served in New York City. It is here that our mission of closing the kindergarten readiness gap is joined by a collective impact initiative with so many partners, City's First Readers. It is here that Jumpstart reaches over 600 volunteers each year who provide direct service in 90 classrooms across the city, serving a bit over 2,000 three to four year old children every year, including our ever expanding after school program. It is here that we have served nearly 4,000 families through community based programming. It is here those 4,000 families are provided some of the tools and resources needed to create a literacy rich home. It is here that our staff, the children we serve, our families, are able to thrive with the support of City's First Readers Initiative and the support of the City Council. It is here we have the absolute honor to work with the City's First Readers partners, all of whom share a vital component of reaching our collective mission. We thank the City Council for its support and its continued support for this vital effort and initiative. Thank you. Thank you. And I want to thank you for your patience because I know you were one of the first people I saw here. <laughs> yeah. So I really want to thank you. I, you thank came you. in the door with me. Thank you. Well, you were here before me. Thank you. Good evening. <laughs> My name is Jillian Miller and I'm the coordinator of early learning services for the Queens Public Library. I'm here today representing the three library systems of New York City. We are truly grateful for the City Council's generous support of City's First Readers. Each year, Brooklyn Public Library, New York Public Library, and Queens Library offer neighborhood early literacy programs with an annual attendance this year exceeding 600,000 people. As part of City's First Readers, each library system is developing and expanding its own early literacy services. Here are some highlights. Brooklyn Public Library is rolling out 12 new play nooks in children's areas of their libraries. 
They are refreshing with 44 branches where they have already established these nooks. New York Public Library updated and provided new early literacy corners and play materials in 87 neighborhood branches. Queens Public Library was able to offer a large scale pilot of hands-on programs to early learners in all of our library branches. This focused on higher ordered thinking and problem solving through creation. A few examples of how this initiative has allowed us to collaborate with the program partners in unique ways. Literacy Inc. has worked with the libraries to provide programs to families citywide and has helped to coordinate this effort. BPL hosted the very first City's First Readers play date last summer. Each of the City's First Readers partners brought a developmentally appropriate literacy boosting play activity to this event to model for families how, support, how to support literacy at home. Jumpstart has provided volunteers for NYPL's programs throughout the year and has participated in four Reach the Record events. PCHP has been a strong partner, specifically with Queens Library, encouraging families to get library cards and bringing their families to City's First Reader sponsored library programs. Reach Out and Read medical providers are prescribing reading and are prescribing library cards to their families. If the City Council authorizes $6 million in fiscal year 2020 for the City's First Readers Initiative, this vitally important work will only grow in New York City's libraries. We could expand specialized family learning opportunities, grow school readiness activities, and provide more training, which is necessary for our staffs in working with families with very young children. Public libraries play a critical role in our society. We are the last open democratic institution that seeks to transform people's lives by providing free access to knowledge and information and by creating opportunities for growth and empowerment to all. Libraries are for everyone, regardless of people's background or identity. We are proud of all we have accomplished this year and are optimistic about the future. While deeply appreciative of the Council's and Mayor's efforts, we cannot rest on our laurels because there is still a great deal of work to do. Demand for our programs and services are at an all-time high, and we are providing six-day service at all of our libraries with an operating budget that cannot sustain it. Faced with increased demand and rising costs, we continue to need your help. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Good evening, uh, Madam Chair, and to staff, and also to the entire City Council. Uh, good evening, my name is Andre Eaton. I'm the New York State Director for the Parent Child Home Program. Let me first start by saying thank you for your past support, and we hope uh, your continuing support of the City's First Readers Initiative. Um, the Parent Child Pro Home Program is just one part of the City's First Readers Initiative, uh, with our unique focus is on providing parents with the skills, knowledge, and materials they need to support school readiness skills in the home and helping to build home environments that build children's language, literacy, cognitive, and social emotional development skills. In doing this work, we are also helping parents learn what to look for in a child care setting, how to identify and access uh, their children's next educational steps, and how to support the children's continued academic progress. Our partners in this work in New York City and elsewhere in the state include school districts, public libraries, social service agencies, literacy programs, and other community-based organizations. Focusing on school readiness and early literacy support for families challenged by poverty, isolation, limited education, and language and literacy barriers, PCHP has provided over 46,000 home visits and distributed over 23,000 books and educational toys um, in New York City alone. Before children enter pre-K or kindergarten, low-income children and low-income from uh, non-native English-speaking families in New York City are likely to be cared for by family members or in informal settings. They are the least likely children to have access to the information, materials, and activities that will build their school readiness skills and ensure the language and early literacy skills that they need to enter a classroom ready to be successful students. For these reasons, it is particularly important that in supporting the City's First Readers Initiative, we ensure that they and their families have access to the knowledge, skills, and materials that will support their school readiness. PCHP provides critical learning tools, books, and ed other educational and language simulating materials to families with two and three year olds. This is an age group that, have, that often has very limited access to literacy supports. The program helps families build literacy in rich environments in their homes. They are visited twice a week in their homes by an early learning specialist or home visitor who introduces the materials to the family and models for the parents how to read, talk, and play with children to build language and critical early literacy skills. 
PCHP staff also connects families to other social service aid supports when necessary and assists parents with registering their children for a, a pre-K or Head Start program. This year we've added uh, to the initiative by working with family child care providers in Sunset Park, Brooklyn, South Jamaica, and Astoria in Queens to enhance their skills as well when taking care of children or parents who are not able to be a part of our core model inside PCHP. So PCHP continues to be pleased to be one uh, part of the City's First Readers Initiative. Working with our partners in this initiative, we are able to not only provide intensive early literacy support to 100 additional families challenged by poverty, isolation, language, and literacy barriers in communities such as Astoria, Washington Heights, Sunset Park, Brownsville, East New York, and also South Jamaica. So we hope and, and continue to urge the council to please support us at the $6 million level to continue to expand our, our services citywide. Thank you so much. I'm honored to be the last one. My name is Dr. Erin Roby from New York University, NYU Langone Health, and the Video Interaction Project, or VIP. VIP uses pediatric health care to enhance children's early development and school readiness. Pedi pediatric checkups are a unique way to reach low-income families, since all parents have to bring their children to the doctor, allowing programs like VIP and Reach Out and Read to achieve high impacts at a low cost. During their pediatric checkups, families in VIP meet with a facilitator who provides a book or a toy, videotapes the parent and child as they read or play together, and then reviews the video to point out strengths that every parent has. Through City's First Readers, these parents are also connected with other literacy programs in their communities. VIP not only promotes early literacy, but also empowers parents to be their child's first teacher. Rigorous studies show that children in VIP have improvement in skills like language, problem solving, and behavior that will help them to succeed in school. This vital funding from City's First Readers has allowed us to bring VIP to more locations and more children. For example, in this past year, CFR allowed us to expand VIP to a pediatric clinic, clinic in Harlem. In addition, last year we conducted a scientific study of aspect of aspects of City's First Readers, and our findings demonstrated that using health care to promote literacy through CFR is associated with increased use of library and other community literacy services. And together, this association with parents, re with re parents reading more with their children at home. These findings demonstrate that the potential for large impacts across New York City if City's First Readers is expanded. Impressively, CFR has been endorsed by the American Academy of Pediatrics and was highlighted this February at the meeting of the prestigious American Association for the Advan Advancement of Science. Colleagues from across the country have been inspired by CFR and want to model it in their regions. It is vital that C City's First Readers continues to grow. Increased funding next year will allow us to reach more children and more families, showing that New York City is a forward-thinking city with a priority to help its youngest residents succeed. Thank you very much. I want to again thank you. Thank you for your patience and um, for your advocacy and your efforts on behalf of New York City's children. Um, and with that, this hearing is adjourned. Thank you. 6.25 p.m. Adjourned at 6.23.